Hi guys, it's Katie Brinshoten, the founder and the CEO of Sturdum Solutions here in North Carolina. And today we're here to go over a refresher of my very popular QuickBooks Online demo video. Uh, the last one was 45 minutes long. We're gonna see how long this one will be, uh, some quick, uh, thoughts on this. We use this video actually as a precursor to our live Q&As. Um, the reason we do that is because our Q&As are typically 30 minutes to an hour long. Our demo videos tend to take up the bulk of that time. So a lot of times we will use the demo videos in a way to help prompt some questions so we can dive into your unique situation once we're on that Q&A. Uh, with that being said, uh, please make sure that you do keep track of any questions because we're going to be running through it. I will try not to talk too fast. There are some great new features that I'm very excited to talk about. So let's go ahead and get started, shall we? Okay, so to the this is right here actually your main dashboard. Um, right, It usually opens up to get things done. And the thing that I love about the Get Things Done screen is that it's really desktop-esque. So for those of you that are coming over from desktop, if you remember the desktop screen with the little arrows that kind of point you from icon to icon, say do this in order and so on like that, uh, this is where you'll get that experience, okay? Um, it's great for new users, people that are in training and so on. Um, so that part there is, is really user-friendly. Uh, there's also a business overview which is not to be confused with business view. You actually have two views in account or in QuickBooks Online. And again, we're in QuickBooks Online Advanced. Um, you have business view and accountant view. Okay, so business view is going to use some general terminology um, for, uh, for the day-to-day -day use. If you need to get into the nitty gritty a little deeper, maybe you're their in-house accountant and so forth, you'll wanna use accountant view, okay? So under business overview, this is actually in beta. You've got your widgets and your dashboards, okay? You can customize these, but they're, they're canned dashboards. So if you're looking for something like Power BI, this isn't it. But if you do wanna do something with Power BI, if you got somebody that works with Power BI, you can use this as a data source. So you can use QuickBooks Online as a data source for your uh, Power BI, so that's pretty cool. Cash flow. So your cash flow actually plugs in off of your bank, okay? And it kind of does like a, you know, a cash flow dashboard right here, but you have to update, you have to have, attach your bank accounts in order to see this. This is just a demo, okay? If you're looking for forward planning of your cash flow, you can go to planner and that does your forward planning for your cash flow. Okay, it doesn't do like a full on forecast, but it does forecast your cash flow itself. Um, another side note, like if you're into third party apps, one app that I really love is Live Plan. So with Live Plan, we can actually attach it to QuickBooks Online and you can do some you know, scenarios and things like that. And it creates a really nice way to keep a narrative of your business for use with lenders you know, and other uh, stakeholders that you may encounter. Okay, so let me see. Let's go ahead and click here. Okay, and again, I'm going to kind of go over a lot of these features, but I don't have all the time to dive in. My manufacturing demo is two hours long, and I've been told on numerous occasions that people, that it's, a, it's hard to watch a whole thing at once. So we do break it up by chapters, but I do want to try to keep this under two hours if possible. All right, so we're gonna start out with account and settings. Um, so the reason I do that is because um, your account and settings really do impact the entire data file. So if you're brand new to QuickBooks, you're actually gonna get a wizard that asks you for things like your tax form and your industry and has some have to fill out questions just to be able to access the software, right? Well, if you're like me, which I probably shouldn't admit on video, um, not with QuickBooks, but with other software, sometimes I am guilty of going, let me fill out what I have to fill out but um, I just wanna get in and play around, okay? So um, moving on from there, you don't wanna do that with QuickBooks Online. The reason being is you have several settings in here that may not be required, but are really helpful to make sure that you're making the most use of your software investment. 
So we have our logo here in our company name. This is all kind of self-explanatory. You have your tax form. If you're filling this out for the first time, it will be in that wizard, but uh, it will also, you can put it here. The very first time you fill out your tax form, it will change your chart of accounts or set up your chart of accounts to reflect the structure for that tax form that you've picked. You can always change it though. All right, so we've got our company email, our company phone and website, our company addresses, and you do have the space for three different types of addresses. So you have your company address, like maybe the one that is for you know the public, what have you, then you have a customer facing address for your invoices, invoice payments, and then if you have a separate legal address, you can actually fill that out as well. I won't touch on billing and subscription because it's pretty, it's exactly what you expect from a billing and subscription piece, but we will touch on usage limits. There are multiple tiers of QuickBooks Online. There's QuickBooks Online Advanced, which is what we're demoing today. So if you don't have features available in your QuickBooks and you wonder why they're in here and not with yours, it's probably because this is QuickBooks Online Advanced and you may not have that one. Below QuickBooks Online Advanced is QuickBooks Online Plus. Amazing software, has probably 90% of the features that is that are here. Uh, great to use, some usage limits maybe, but still, probably the most popular software package out of the tiers. Underneath that, you have QuickBooks Online Essentials. Underneath that, you have Simple Start, okay? Either one may be a fit for you. If you need help to decide which of those is a fit for you, go ahead and set up an appointment with our team. So under usage limits, you have 25 billable users allowed to QuickBooks Online Advance. If this was in QuickBooks Plus, I believe it is, I want to say five, they may have increased it. And it used to be that Essentials is three. Uh, for an updated uh, list of that, please make sure to check with us. Uh, you also get unlimited chart of accounts. They are limited if you have one of the other tiers. Same thing with classes and locations and tag groups. We will go over what each one of these are further along in our demo. Okay, our sales tab. So you can customize the way forms look to your customers. If you've used QuickBooks in the past, you know this song and dance. They have multiple ways to access just about every feature and this is no different. You can customize the look and feel from here. And what it does is it brings you over to custom form settings where you can play around there and we will cover that later on in our demo. So we will go ahead and move on to sales form content. Under preferred invoice terms, you know, these, that's pretty self-explanatory, the terms you have on your invoice. I usually actually prefer to do something like net 15 that will give the customer a very distinct idea of when their invoice is due. If you say due upon receipt, it can be construed as ambiguous and uh, having a date there is always better in my opinion. If you have your own terms and they are not listed in the dropdown, you can actually set up your own terms. So we're gonna say custom terms, which typically I would say like net 20. Here, let's just do it. Net 20 days. Okay. And you can say due in a fixed number of days, 20 days. Okay, if you want it due by a certain day of the month, you can select that. Due the next month if issued in within so many days of, of due date. Uh, pick what's right for your business. Preferred delivery methods, going to say send later, print later, or none. You have a shipping toggle if you need a shipping field. If you have custom fields, another situation where there is another spot, we're gonna go over custom fields, so we won't touch on this today or at this moment, but uh, you can, this is a hyperlink to go ahead and change your custom fields. Custom transaction numbers are fantastic. Uh, the if you go without custom transaction numbers, your first invoice is one, then your next one is two, and so forth. You get the hint. Uh, what I typically like to do is set up like 2000 as my first one. I'll turn on custom transaction numbers, put it in, and then it is sticky. It knows to go consecutively afterwards. So it will automatically suggest 2001 on the next one and so forth, okay? Service date, if you do have ap applicable service dates on your invoices, then that will be on. As you can see to the side, service date is required when using revenue recognition. And that is actually one of those new features that I absolutely love. So here's me going through my time machine. I used to work with an ERP that did revenue recognition and 
The QuickBooks version of revenue recognition is to either do a journal entry or to do invoices dated for each month to recognize the revenue that you need to recognize, okay? Not totally ideal. Um, it, this is not, I don't believe, available in desktop actually, but was recently added where you can now do revenue recognition in QuickBooks Online. Another thing that's, that's been recently updated and refreshed in QuickBooks Online, which I'm a huge fan of, is the fixed asset tracking, right? Why is that? In desktop, you have fixed asset manager, depending on the desktop version you had, you could track all kinds of depreciation schedules, like makers, however, whatever you needed to track, you could. With QuickBooks Online, you can't track as many types of depreciation. I believe it's straight line, one and a half times accelerated. I can't remember. There's like three options. We'll touch on it later. Um, but you can now do uh, depreciation schedules. Same thing with revenue recognition. You can now do revenue recognition. Revenue recognition may not be applicable if you are a cash-based business, okay? Why is that? Because the definition of a cash-based business is, if you watch my constructive receipt video, that's part of it. When I receive my money, that is when, or when I constructively receive the money from the customer, that's when I recognize it. It's not when I do the invoice, okay? And until you hit a certain threshold, you can be cash basis. I think that once you hit a particular threshold, I can't remember what it is now, but you have to switch over to accrual. But before that point, and the threshold's very high, it's in the millions, I wanna say, it used to be six million, but it's higher than that now. Um, anyway, uh, you will need to switch to accrual. Um, where was I? If you are accrual basis, however, and you need to track revenue recognition, uh, that's different than cash basis. Now, why is that different? That's because with accrual basis accounting, you are recognizing the revenue when it was earned. And in QuickBooks speak, they think that means when the invoice was done, right? But if you have subscriptions that you bill customers for and you bill them for a one year subscription, guess what? you're only really supposed to recognize one month of that subscription every month. And to date, what you had to do was a manual journal entry, a manual invoice, uh, maybe an internal invoice, some way to allocate that revenue because just dating that one invoice for their, say if you did $1,200 for a subscription, it was gonna recognize that $1,200 in that one month, which technically does not follow GAP and does not follow the accrual principles, but now you can, okay? We'll touch on that later. So if you need a discount field on your sales forms, there you go. A deposit field on your sales forms, there you go. That being said, the deposit form um, is a little, I prefer to use a manual deposit where I have a line item for my deposit, but you know, if it works for you, it works for you. Same thing with accept tips and tags and we will touch on what tags are later because I have this great conversation about classes and tags that I love to talk about, okay? Invoice payments. Set your invoice payment instructions for all new invoices, okay? If you have QuickBooks payments enabled, which we will touch on shortly, it will actually give you the option to say, I want ACH only, I want credit card only, I want them to have the option of either, Historically, what you could do is you can say only offer ACH. Why? Because my fees are lower, okay? And they're going to have to put in a bank account to, in order to pay, uh, but you save those higher credit card fees. If alternatively, uh, you have a customer that says, hey, I really need to put this one on a credit card, you can actually turn that on at the invoice level. Now, as we've progressed since I've, you know, I've been around for a little bit, um, it's pretty default to have all credit card payments at this point, but the option's still there. If you work in a business that takes a lot of checks, go ahead and use that ACH trick where you can do ACH only, it'll keep your fees down, um, and then turn on credit cards if somebody requests it on a specific account and et cetera. Otherwise, don't worry about it. If you don't have Intuit payments turned on, you can also put in payment instructions like go ahead and contact us to pay. Products and services, okay? And keep in mind, we're in the sales section right now, so once we get to the invoices section, you will see how all this really plays into things. Uh, you can hit show product and service column on sales forms. Do I have SKUs I need to track? 
we can put that on. Price rules, which are just exactly what you think. Do I have a sale going on? Do I have particular price rules for a customer? That's actually in beta is a newer feature. Uh, you can turn that on. Quantity and price rate, turn that on. Inventory quantity on hand, turn that on. Um, side note on that, if you use a third party e-commerce app, which you know most people that are in e-commerce do, make sure you pay very close attention to how they want you to set up QuickBooks online in order to play nicely with their software. Sometimes they don't want you tracking inventory in QuickBooks, okay? So keep that in mind before you're toggling this button back and forth and creating a headache for yourself. Revenue recognition, which we just talked about, is going to say how often do you recognize your revenue? And this will come into play on your invoices and it's kind of difficult to change on the fly. So make sure you pick what works for you. Um, do you need to recognize your revenue daily or monthly? Most people will choose monthly, but speak to your tax advisor or your accountant about what's appropriate to you. Late fees, you can calculate late fees, but funny enough, the thing that we were talking about with accrual versus cash basis customers. To me, late fees should be uh, recognized within the period that the late fee, fee was accruing. What QuickBooks will do is put the late fee on the invoice. So if you're invoicing for March and you're and they have charged a late fee, that late fee is good and you had, it, yeah, your invoice was in March and you're back say April, May, June, and that late fee is accruing, it's accruing on the March invoice. So it's not really reflective of gap, okay? Um, so what I typically do is I do my manual uh, invoices for late fees if I'm on an accrual basis. So that is over the term that is being recognized. If you are a cash basis customer um, or company, it doesn't matter as much to you, it's fine, okay? Uh, but at the end of the day, it's really what your preference is. I don't like my invoices changing once I did them the first time. To me, it's a new invoice, okay? But you can turn that on. Okay, progress invoicing. If, we, if you have an invoice and you need to create multiple invoices from a single estimate, maybe if you're working in construction and um, you're like, I know that once you get to a certain size, you kind of want to look at some add-ons. I think we work a lot with Noify and Builder Trend and some others. Um, if you're still, if you want to work within QuickBooks, progress invoicing is a must. Other situations where maybe you're doing a project for someone and you're getting percentage at certain milestones, you know, it's really helpful for that too. And I'm sure there's tons of other use cases. I'm, try I'm trying not to talk a lot, but you know it goes against everything in my personality. So let's keep going. All right, messages, default message sent with sales forms. You can go ahead and fill this out. For those of you that quit, use QuickBooks Online Plus, uh, you would actually be able to do your invoice reminders here, and I think it allows up to three. With QuickBooks Online Advanced, it keys off of the workflows, so you actually do this part, you do your invoice reminders in a different part, if that makes sense, okay? And then you say, email me a copy, uh, copy new invoices to, there you go, you can read here. If I'm sending an estimate, what do I want it to say and so forth, okay? Reminders, okay, so here's our reminders, but as you can see, it doesn't really give you how often, okay, and like I said, that's all done under the workflow. If you had plus, you will fill all that out here. Okay, second guessing myself for a minute, but yes, that's it. I actually did a whole video on comparing them, but. Okay, email options for all sales forms. Show sort, show blah, blah show short summary in email. Sally sells seashells at the seashore. Okay, uh, show full details in email, PDF attached. I always attach a PDF, okay? All right, then we've got statements. Do you wanna have an invoicing or have a, a aging table at the bottom of your statement? Always, always. I don't understand, I, to me more information is always better, okay? So that's the sales setup for account settings. If you are used to enterprise, you will notice that this is a lot more truncated than what they have. Um, they are adding new features all the time. Enterprise is an amazing product and we also use that. I would say we probably do 50-50 enterprise and online. Um, so just keep that in mind. One size does not fit all. So if you wanna talk through the online versus enterprise situation, just give us a call. Okay, let's go over to expenses. So we're still working on preferences at this point. 
Under bills and expenses, show items table on expense and purchase forms. We've turned that on. Show tags field on expense and purchase forms is on. Track expenses and items by customer, turn it on. Again, kind of think through your processes when you're filling these out. Like if I didn't have to track expenses and items by customer, if I was like, you know, a retail store and I, you know, sold, um, like uh, fishing supplies, you know, and maybe, you know, I'm just, I'm just keeping it simple. I don't have any major house customers, things like that. I'll probably turn that off. But then if I'm in professional services and I'm traveling for clients and I'm doing other things for clients or I'm an interior designer and I'm buying stuff on my client's behalf, yes, I would definitely turn that on. Do I need to make expenses and items billable? Again, you would pro if I'm tracking it by customer, I'm probably also making it billable. Um, however, that being said, that's not always true. So just keep in mind your personal processes and walk through this video with your accountant and you guys make the decisions that make the most sense for your company. Mark up with a default rate of zero. I obviously did not put this in because I never put less than 3.5%. Why is that? Okay. So if you think about it, when you're invoicing a customer, if they're paying with a credit card, you're paying at least typically 3.5% in merchant services fees. So why would you buy something for a customer, you know, even if you're asking for reimbursement and charge it to them at zero, you've just cost yourself 3.5% of that transaction because you're gonna get charged merchant service fees when they pay that invoice. So do yourself a favor, see what your merchant service fees are and consider that the floor of whatever you're gonna charge for your markup, okay? Track billable expenses and items as income. This to me is really just a preference. Like if you wanna, um, if you kind of want stuff to write off the expense, you can pick in multiple accounts. If you're wanting to say markup income or something like that, just have everything in one place on your P&L, you can also do that one. It's really, it just depends on how your business operates. Do you charge sales tax? Most people nowadays do, unless you're in professional services. And heck, I, you know, states actually right now are making a massive push in the sales tax arena. Um, they're approaching that as a revenue driver, which it is a revenue driver. But from what I understand is they're making even more of a push towards sales tax and fine tuning that with all the e-commerce that goes on and the rest of it. Make sure you're up to date on your state sales tax rules. I'm in North Carolina. So if you're in Montana, you double check everything, please. Okay. Uh, when it pertains to your taxes. Default bill payment terms net 15 or so on. Again, this is just a preference. Okay. So let's hit save. Okay. Do I use purchase orders? Purchase orders are crucial. And this also reminds me of something else. If you notice, it doesn't talk about sales orders. Why? Sales orders do not exist in QuickBooks Online. If you are a business that has to have, bar none, absolutely has to have a sales order, you do not want to go with QuickBooks Online. You want to look at advanced. Okay. And talk to our team about it. Um, but on the other side, and actually funny enough, I'm not exactly sure why they don't have sales orders. I fully expect that to be a new feature at some point. Uh, you can repurpose estimates as sales orders. So if you need to talk through that, uh, let me know. It will not pull from inventory like you can with enterprise, you know, where you can say, pull this from my quantity available if it's on a sales order, but it's still, you know, it can be used as a sales order for your customer. Purchase orders, on or off, okay? Uh, and then it says custom fields. Again, we're going to touch on that later, um, but let's go ahead and keep going. Default message on our purchase orders. Save. And messages. Did I just touch on that? Okay. And then this is very similar to the invoices. So you can just set up any message that you would have with a purchase order. It's really helpful if you have specific shipping instructions, uh, packaging instructions, like if you have a contract manufacturer, things like that, to use any very specific instructions for your vendors in that area, okay? Under payments, we spoke about using Intuit payments. Um, if you check with us, actually, we can make sure that you get a great deal on QuickBooks payments, so we'd really appreciate it. But if you wanna set it up in product, you can also do that here. Once QuickBooks Payments is set up for your file, they typically attach it to your file for you. But again, if you have any trouble, reach out to the team. Time. Who tracks time? You do have the QuickBooks time that used to be T-sheets back in the day. I'm aging myself. I Up until very recently, I still had T-sheets, T-shirts in my swag room. Um, but uh, QuickBooks acquired them several years ago, and so it's slowly being brought into the... Uh, 
infrastructure, UI of QuickBooks Online, however you want to say that. Um, but this will tell you who is tracking time. You can have vendors or employees that track time. And I believe we have a QuickBooks time demo. If we don't, we'll make sure we get one. Um, the other day I tried to open it. There you go. I was going to say I opened it the other day. It takes forever to pop up. But this will tell you who is set up for time tracking. Okay. What is the first day of your work week? Mine is always Monday. You guys can do you. Pick what, you, what works for you. Do I need to show my service field? Do I need to allow time to be billable? Show the billing rate to any users entering their time and so forth. You can set all that up here. With QuickBooks Time, you have a lot of more fine tuning you can do. So um, if you have complicated time entering instructions, configurations, customer setups, scheduling, things like that, definitely worth a look. Okay, so now we're to what I would say is my favorite screen in the account and preferences because it's to me, it's the real guts of everything. And it touches on something I try to preach every day. Um, and so it gives me a chance to talk about it. So, okay, so we're under the advanced tab. Under accounting, you wanna make sure you're filling out the first month of your fiscal year. Typically, I think they say something like 90% of businesses are calendar fiscal year, but there's always that 10%. And I know that statistic is not correct, but I heard it at a seminar recently, and um, I know it's at least 90 or above our fiscal year. Uh, if you're not fiscal year, pick the first month of your fiscal year. The first month of your income tax year, typically that'll be the same as your fiscal year. Accounting method, are you set for, up for accrual of cash? This is really critically important because if you don't, uh, know what the difference is between accrual and a cash accounting. I have seen where people are cash basis taxpayers, but then have their books set on accrual reporting and they will wonder why they don't match. That's because, you know, there you go. You have to, you want them to match, but you can toggle your reports back and forth. But you want to make sure your accounting follows your tax method whenever possible. Close the books. This is the one, this is I wish this was in a way more prominent place because people don't know this is here and it saves so much headache for our customers, okay? When you close the books, you can keep Sally, Bob, and anybody else that wants to fiddle in the books out or at least give them a heartily worded warning, okay? But it can't do that if you don't set your closing dates and turn on this feature. So. Uh, I would say the most critically important time of year to do this is when you're doing your taxes, have finished your taxes. I don't want to look back at the end of next year and go, why do your numbers not match? Um, somebody went in in March and updated the year previous after we did the tax return. Okay, don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. So set your closing date. That way no one can get in the books, okay? And this is what we do. We find the most conservative person in the office, the bookkeeper, the CEO, whoever can keep a secret. And you say, allow changes after viewing a warning and entering the password, because guess what's gotta happen? You can also say viewing a warning, but to me, um, I always, I, I wanna eliminate any room for error, okay? So warning and password, because within my mind I go, if you don't do it, you can't go, ah, it's fine, because it's changing this. And I'm going, no, 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 still not fine. Um, you have to come to the office and go, what's the password? And we can give you the password. Um, if the if you do get that password, I can tell you what I'm going to do as your bookkeeper is I'm going to change the password right after you make that update. Okay? That way you maintain control over your closed periods and you minimize the room for human error. Again, it's going to ask you for your tax form in your advanced settings. We've talked about that already chart of accounts, do you have account numbers? I love account numbers because if I am um, entering things, I know I can just fly through my account numbers, right? Um, I started out as a data entry clerk in 2000, definitely aging myself now. So uh, I love account numbers. At the same time, not everybody needs them. So if you don't need them, keep life simple. Kiss method, turn them off. No big deal with me. Uh, then you can have your shipping, account, your discount account, your tips account, and so on. Okay, chart of accounts. Okay, on account numbers. If you've never set up your own chart of account numbers before, there is a way you're supposed to do it, okay? Just to give you an example, typically like 
Um, four is her income, five is her COGS, six is expenses, and so forth. But there are, I think there might be slight varying degrees of that. So just make sure you don't just go one, two, three, four, five. I should have mentioned that. Okay, under categories, do we want to track classes? Yes, I'm turning it on. I want to show you. So classes are, and we'll talk about this when we get to classes. If you have a profit and loss or another or a balance sheet and so forth, um, and use the nonprofit equivalent of the terminology, you know, your uh, statement of activity uh, and statement of financial position. Forgive me if I got those wrong. Um, anyway, uh, if you have that equivalent, it's the same thing. So with your profit and loss, with your balance sheet, if you have a chart of accounts and you're like, well, you know, I need to track, you know, supplies for the job, but I really need to track, you know, Jim's team separate from Bob's team. And so I'm just going to add another account to my chart of accounts. Don't have to do it. Don't have to do it. In fact, that makes it messier. Okay. I know when I'm quiet, I get shocked too. But anyway, um, so use classes because what it is, is it will segment horizontally your numbers. So say your P&L, if you've got um, your total amount is $100, so $50 was Bob's team, and I don't remember who the other guy was, say Jim. The other 50 was Jim's team. And you assign the team classes uh, when you're doing the transaction, guess what's going to happen? It's going to break it out. You can also use this for locations. There is a locations function, but if you prefer to use classes, you can also use classes. Um, see here, actually talks about locations here. You can use business units, departments, divisions, property, store, territory, whatever you want to do. And classes and locations are separate, by the way. Okay. Um, but you can, whatever you need to do where you would typically think, well, maybe I need to add a new chart of accounts, account, you don't have to do that. You just add a class. Okay. There is a difference between tags and classes. Tags are also available, and we'll talk about that later in the video. All right, automation. Do we want to pre-fill forms? Heck yeah, I do. Who turned this off? Man. Um, so if you have forms and it wants, do you want it to bring back the information from the previously entered form for that one? Automatically apply credits. Turn this on. If you're, side note, not that anybody will be in this situation. If you're setting up the file for the first time and you're doing imports, you want to make sure that's turned off. Um, because you don't want it willy-nilly applying credits to invoices and things like that when you're trying to bring everything in um, on different data sheets. Same thing with automatically apply bill payments. Once you're up and running, good to go. Automatically invoice on build activity. I don't do that. I like to review what we're invoicing there. Okay. Do we want to use projects? Historically, you could only leave... Let's see, is it going to let us turn this off? It used to be you could not turn... Ah! So it used to be you couldn't turn that off. So that's pretty cool. But uh, projects is self-explanatory. Do you need to organize all job-related activity in one place? It does some cool stuff, but at the same time, it acts, it acts, how do I say this? It's very particular in how it treats certain things. You'll get to know how it works once you start working with projects. I think I did a video on projects. I'll try to touch on it a little bit later. Home currency, you always want to keep it United States dollar. Uh, if you know you do use United States dollars, if you change that home currency, I believe it messes with your bank feeds, like 99% positive. It's going to be difficult to do bank feeds, if not impossible, uh, if your home currency is not the dollar. Uh, if you're in another country, they do have regional uh, versions of QuickBooks Online, so just look for your version. Multi-currency is off. I do believe if you turn multi-currency on, you can't turn it back off. And I'm not going to test that today because I don't want to turn multi-currency on in this file. Do I want to allow members to find me? This is kind of like Facebook for business. Okay. I'm going to turn that off because this is a demo. Okay. Okay. So it's just a networking tool. All right. Other preferences. How do you want your dates to look, your numbers to look? There you go. Let's look at dates. There you go. How, what do you call your customers? Like I call mine clients. You might call yours donors, guests, members, whatever you want to call it. You can change that here. Warn if duplicate check numbers is issued. I always turn that on. 
I actually always turn this one on too. Warn me if I enter a bill number it's already been used for that vendor. Because this is how I see it. I think that I'm pretty smart. But I also recognize there's times when I'm really tired and I have to do things and everybody makes mistakes. So the more things I can set up to keep myself from doing things that I don't want myself to do, um, I try to use those tools. Sign me out if inactive for how many hours. If you're in a high traffic office, I would set this to one. Um, if you're in a quiet office, uh, you can set it to three. Just use whatever you, know, you believe is correct there. Warn me if I enter a quantity or rate outside my usual. Well, that's pretty cool. That's definitely new. <laughs> I want to know what prompted that feature, actually. <laughs> okay, so moving on. So that is preferences. And I'm going to go ahead and pause this video at this time. And next we're going to get into... I don't know. It's going to be a surprise to me too. So we'll see. But thank you so much for watching. I will go ahead and pick this up in just a minute. Aha, I'm back. Okay, so I had to go ahead and get myself recentered there. Let's go ahead and see what we're going to touch on next, shall we? So you do have this tasks option, okay? Uh, this is general tasks. I believe it's on all versions. I don't think it's just the accountant version, but if you have tasks you want to assign to people in office, I believe it's only QuickBooks Online Advanced, but I'm not 100% sure. But you can assign tasks here. And we're going to go ahead and go over to transactions next. So it's so funny. I was just telling somebody the other day we need a bank feed video, but unfortunately we can't do bank feeds with QuickBooks uh, online without having to do a lot of blurring. We're just going to kick over to app transactions. That's just a reminder that I'll go ahead and once we have one that we've got bank feeds actually plugged up to, we will go ahead and do that bank transactions video separately. I'm pretty sure it's because we don't have it set up yet. But going over to app transactions, I have my Shopify demo do not touch. Yeah, so there's a story behind that. I will not go into it today. Um, anyway, if we had Shopify set up here, you'd have your Shopify transactions coming in here. Um, and this actually works very similar to bank feeds. So it does bank feeds work this way too. You'd have your transactions here. You pick, do I want to add them, match them, or exclude them? Excluding is if I already have it in the books, I don't need it in there again, just exclude it. It's not gonna delete the one in the books. It just means it discards the one it brought in from the bank feeds. Um, if you match them, it will bring up a screen and help you match, but it also uses AI to see if there's a transaction in the books that matches it already. And then for review, uh, obviously those are the ones you haven't reviewed yet. If you wanna add it, that means I don't have it in my books yet, so I'm adding it now. So a little bit of history here. It used to be where we would add transactions in and then once they came in, it was a lot of matching. It was a lot of this. I'll be honest with you. As far as technology has come, a lot of this is just managing bank feeds now. And there's not as much manual entry, entry of transactions unless for me, it's a complicated one, like a loan payment or something where I'm breaking out my, my schedules. And uh, I know that once it comes in, I'll just match and I don't have to set up my AM, I have, don't have to enter my AM schedules and stuff like that uh, after the fact. So if it's something where I have like a lot of splits, which is where you have multiple line items and things like that, I'll go ahead and enter it and then match it later. Uh, so if you have transactions that you have brought in, it'll pop up under reviewed and under excluded or ones that I said, you know what, don't worry about bringing it in, it's already there. Uh, or it brought it in twice, which will happen if your bank feed somehow gets disconnected, which will happen sometimes when there's like a maintenance, maintenance release uh, with your bank or with QuickBooks or so on, uh, that, that happens kind of commonly. So you might get like extra transactions brought in where you're like, well, I don't need all these, I already brought them in once, okay? So moving on, under receipts, this is one of my favorite features. I'm really silly, okay? Uh, you can do a forwarding email like here's my Cubo Docs. It's a Cubo Docs email. You set up your own custom email. You can only do it once. You can't change it. So pick something you like. Um, and it will set it up at Cubo Docs and you can send your receipts there. Now, with some exceptions, your receipts will come in, it'll automatically be brought in, and then you can actually review it. So I'm just gonna go ahead and review one of these. Okay, so this is a receipt. Who is my payee? I'm just picking something here. So that's why my bank feeds. No, there it is. Okay. Transaction account, reference number, so on, so on, so on. Okay. Who is it? My account. So it says requested reimbursement on hotel. So I'm just going to pick. Do we have travel in here? 
No, but let's add a new account. You get to see how to add a new account. So we're gonna add travel. I'm just gonna add travel. Okay. I'm just gonna put lodging. Okay. Hit save. Okay. And then if I have a class, I'm not sure who set up these classes, but they're just all kinds of colorful, aren't they? All right, do we need to make it billable? Okay. Hit save and close. And then it falls out. And then you can do the rest of your receipts. Now what happens is once that transaction's in your books like it is now, Let's see if we can pull it up with our recent transactions. Nope, I have to go in and get it. Okay, don't worry about it. Anyway, when you go in and take a look, it's already gonna have the attachment there. If you needed to reconcile, you can, it's so funny, you can do this from multiple places. So we can do it from the gear under the tools button, or we can actually do it from your banking area under transactions. Gotta be patient with me because they've changed all the names to this since our last video, so. Under rules, I love rules, okay? Well, I love rules when it comes to accounting. Okay, test, all right. You can use this for bank rules too. You just wanna go, what is my rule? If it's money out, that's, that's okay. So they've set up the bank accounts as an asset. That's why it's not bringing it up. Okay, include all the following. Description contains whatever, say staples. I think I used to use staples a lot. Um, then assign it as an expense to this category. This is who my payee is. Here's my customer tax. These are awesome because you know what is even better than not entering a transaction by hand and then having to match it. It's just having rules where it comes in and it recognizes itself and it goes in. That being said, okay, the AI people are not gonna like me for this. I love AI. I think anything makes life simpler is awesome within reason when it's good, okay? And I would say AI, uh, and with the bank feeds is 90% there, like it works. It works way better than it used to, uh, where there's like weird little vendors that sometimes will just totally glitch. Like we have one where if you use giftcards.com, it keeps thinking it's cars.com, right? We're not in the habit of buying cars every month. And I don't know of a car that costs $100. So it's the wrong one. But for some reason, it continuously recognizes it as cars, even though it says nowhere does it say cars on it, the transaction itself. So like, that's just an argument to say, just because machines are working on it, okay, and AI is doing it for you, and we very much appreciate AI and how it makes our lives easier, put human eyes on it too, you are ultimately responsible for these numbers. You don't want to sit here and go, well, gosh, I had no idea that was bringing everything in, you know, as this. Uh, so just make sure you put knives on your books on a regular basis, okay? I have fixes for that, by the way. Okay, it does say bank and it does say checking. So I don't know what you're saying today, QuickBooks. You just decided that you're being silly. We have a lot of people that get in here to play around and test things. So I can only imagine what we've done. Moving on, let's see new. Let's see if we can add a bank. I'm gonna add a new bank, okay, bank. Checking operations account. If I do your books, the first account I add is usually your operations account. Now let's hit save. Okay. I'm wondering if that'll fix it. No. Okay. So there's obviously a glitch here. I'll look at that later. All right. So moving on, we've talked about bank transactions, which are just like app transactions, but connected to your bank. We've talked about receipts. We've talked about reconciling. We've talked about rules. We've talked about chart of accounts, which we've not talked about reconciling. Actually, we talked about how it was available somewhere else. Chart of accounts is available somewhere else. Also, if you are a shortcut key wizard, there's actually a list of shortcut keys that you can use to get to a lot of this stuff without even having to use the toolbar. Okay. Okay, so let's go over to your reconciliation screen. I'm just gonna jump over this away to show you the uh, alternate way of accessing this reconciliation. Both ways will get you the same exact place. So it's just whatever you prefer. Reconciliations right here under your tools menu. Okay, I'm just gonna pick checking church checking account. I'm gonna put the same balance. I don't intend to do a whole lot with it. Um, and then I'm gonna put ending date 8.30. Somebody has recently done 
a demo with it. So, so I'll help them carry this forward a little bit, right? Okay. And then if you have, I don't ever use these screens because usually at this point, it used to be back in the day when you had the paper statements and you didn't have bank feeds and bank rules. Um, yes, you needed to enter your service charges. Honestly, if they dropped this tomorrow, it would not upset me. But I'm sure there's people that use paper statements that would disagree with me on that. So what it does is it brings this up, it says your statement ending balance, here's your cleared balance, your beginning balance, and it makes sure everything ties in. Ours ties in because we said that we're not gonna select anything, and it says zero dollars difference. If one of these were different, it would show that I did have a difference, okay? And then you can use these little toggles to select and unselect, okay? And pick whatever you wanna reconcile for that account. Okay, if you are reconciling for 2023 and you see transactions on here from 2020, you've got a problem. Make sure we're fixing it, but I'll show you where we get to look at that here in a minute. So I'm going to hit finish. Done. Okay, now let's say that I kind of want to take a look at how my reconciliations have gone. In case you haven't seen it, I went to uh, his historical summary. It was historical summary. It's up at the top right. Okay. So I'm gonna take a look at my bank reconciliation report. It doesn't really scream that it makes these, so it's easy to not see it, but it's a really important report for two reasons. Well, first off, when you're in this screen, you can attach your statement, right? So I'm a massive fan of attaching documents straight to your financial software, as long as you're not intending to leave, because believe you me, pain in the neck to move attachments from one financial software to another. Um, we can usually do it in bulk, but attaching every one to every single transaction, if you know a way to do it, give me a holler because it, to me, is just a, it's an absolute nightmare. Anyway, moving on. So you can take a look at your reconciliation report and it's got a summary of what you just did, which if you've taken an accounting class, this looks very similar to the module they do on reconciliations any unclear checks and payments. In theory, this should be very minimal, like maybe a couple that were sent out the last day of the month, they haven't cleared yet. Okay, that makes sense. If you're looking at things like this, where you're like 2020 and going down here, you're like, okay, I got, I have some cleanup to do. That's your first sign. You've got some cleanup to do in your file, okay? And then unclear deposits and credits, same thing. And ideally, you don't really see a lot of activity here. You just see a record of what you just reconciled, okay? That's why reconciliation reports are really, really important. Um, and a lot of people don't know they're there. So, okay, moving on. Okay, so we went through transactions and we've officially gone through reconciliation. I'm having to talk myself through this because I know I'll miss something. Next, we're gonna to touch on advanced accounting and we're going to pick on fixed assets, okay? Because that's the only singular thing there. Quite honestly, I know that means there's some new coming because I don't know why you'd have advanced accounting fixed assets. You could just get rid of the advanced accounting, put the fixed assets over there, but that's okay. We're going to click on fixed assets and I feel like an advanced accountant now. Okay. Do I need to add multiple assets or one asset? I'm going to pick one and I'm going to put in building. Okay. Actually, let's, okay, let's put in building. Okay. And then we're going to say, what's, what class do we want? So typically if something's overhead here, where'd my screen go? Don't do this to me. Okay. It's grayed out. So I'm going to pick a different one. There we go. Um, well, I'll show you how to add classes later. It's wanting to put up a window behind my window and I don't want to stop the video. So we're just going to move on. Location store one, description. But what I was saying was, before I was so rudely interrupted with an unexpected result from my software, um, is that, um, what was I saying? Oh, if you have general overhead, I usually have a class called GNA. For me, I use it to tr personally use the classes to track our teams and I use it for some KPI reporting. So I have GNA and then I have all the teams is how I typically use it. But again, um, you have to pick what's most impactful for you. Okay, so purchase price, let's put $350,000. What's our salvage value? So if you know about depreciation, you always have to depreciate the value over the salvage value, okay? So we're gonna say maybe the land is worth 100,000. Maybe our salvage value is 100,000. Let's say 30 years. 
depreciation method. You get straight line, double declining, 150% accelerated. Okay, typically, so this is how depreciation typically works, is that as long as your depreciable method is not, how does it go? Book value is not substantially different from your tax values. You can typically just pick your tax value depreciation if you want it to match your tax returns. If you really want to stick with gap, you kind of want to stick with a gap accepted depreciation method. Um, and then you'll just acknowledge when you're doing your tax returns, you know, there's some true ups there, just like if you had like back in the day with meals or meals, um, 50% deductible. I don't even think it's deductible right now. I need to go back and double check. Um, anyway, say you have a 50% deductible item, you know, it's not always going to be true to your tax return. Okay. Depreciation start date. So this is the date. I wish it said actually date put in service because, uh, with depreciation, you're supposed to start depreciating the day you put it in service. So if you built a building in June and you're not moving into September, to me, I think September is probably the most conservative uh, depreciation start date because that's the day that it went into use. Uh, but talk with your tax pro uh, about what is appropriate for you. Okay, so I'm just going to put 929. What's my asset account? Do I have one for buildings? No, I do not. Are you going to mess with me if I hit add new? Oh, no. No, did I not? Ah, it didn't. Okay, cool. Buildings. Okay, buildings. And if it helps, I'm also on a Mac, and I love my Mac. I absolutely love my Mac. But um, in fact, I keep a PC laptop, but everything else I do on my Mac nowadays. But um, what am I looking for? Depreciation expense account. There we go. Accumulated depreciation. This is your contra account that's going to be a negative against the actual amount of your fixed asset. It doesn't all go in the same account. You have your depreciable asset and then you have your accumulated depreciation, which I'm going to pick this one, but typically I would honestly keep an accumulated depreciation account. Personally, because I'm kind of nitpicky, I might keep it separate for each one. This is where I was trying to get to. It, it does your entire depreciation schedule. So up till now, if I was... In enterprise with a fixed asset manager, you could plug it in there and you could get something similar to this. Um, now with QuickBooks Online, I think we found like two or one or two third party apps out there that would do fixed asset tracking, but for the most part, it didn't really exist at the moment. So you did a lot of it by hand in Excel, but now you're right back to being able to do this, uh, get your depreciation schedule. So honestly, yeah, I love it. I absolutely love it. Okay. And again, you'll want to talk over, if you're doing depreciation, talk this over with your tax pro and talk this over with your CPA or your accountant and figure out what's the best for you guys. Okay. So advanced accounting, that was easy. That's just one. So let's move on. I love this. We're starting to make some progress, guys. All right. So under sales, we have our sales overview where you get your dashboard. This is pushing me to sign up for Intuit Merchant Services, which is uh, what we've talked about. You can actually use the GoPayment app. You can set up an invoice. You can actually also get payment links. And I can't remember exactly. I think you get one payment link that you can send somebody that is a unique link and they can use it to pay the invoice, like if you text it to them or something. And that's new. Er, new er, okay. Moving on. I will say, if you look at some of my old videos, I'm very pro desktop. I'm still very pro desktop. And I, what I will say in my old videos is um, QuickBooks Online is just getting there. It's not quite there yet, but it's getting there. And we chose to invest in a product that we thought had a really bright future. And we knew it was going over some bumps, but um, you know, we're in it for the long haul. And we wanna go with a product that we know is gonna scale and have, um, that we can invest our team in. So I will say that with like things like revenue recognition that is now there, the depreciation schedules, that's just been super awesome to me. It makes me very excited to work with QuickBooks and I'm very excited about QuickBooks Online and where it's going. That being said, still know there's issues. Like <laughs> I saw somebody the other day saying, you know, support's an issue. Like. A lot of the support people are amazing, but it's with anything. You may call one time, have somebody awful, hang up, have somebody wonderful. That literally just happened in our office. Um, if you're having trouble with support, call CERTUM. 
you know, because we're here to help and we know all this and we know the ins and outs and we know we're in the top 2% of solution providers for QuickBooks nationwide as of the date of this recording. So um, come to us, we're here to help. All right, moving on from my little uh, plug, my, it's not shameless, it's totally, there's, there's, I'm being, I'm being, my ego's coming out. All right, so moving on. New transaction, do I wanna do one invoice, multiple invoices? Do I wanna import invoices? For those that have multiple invoices, you need to get them all in at one time, go ahead and use import. That being said, uh, I, you know what I'm starting to realize, I say that being said a lot. Okay, uh, one thing with QuickBooks Online, if you have high amounts of data, saying it's a wonderful product and it's amazing, it doesn't mean it's for everybody. You know, I wouldn't use this for a multi-billion dollar company. I don't know that I'd use it for someone just starting out. I believe I'd use it for someone starting out. Um, it depends on where you are in the growing of your business. And what you wanna look at is, where's my business going? And what do I need to go into so that I have something for now? Like we'll get people that'll talk to us and they'll say, you know, I'm trying to save a little bit of money. I think I'm gonna stick with QuickBooks Online, but I really expect to kind of outgrow it within three years, but we're not gonna use it for now. No, why do you want you to put yourself through that much pain and heartache for something you expect to use for less than three years? Try to look for something that's scalable with you, okay? Now that being said, it is, uh, it is an extremely robust product. I believe it earns every penny of its price um, and for the right customers. So just take a look at it, decide what's good for you. And we can, again, I've said it a hundred times, but if you have questions, leave us a comment reach out to us. We'll go through enterprise with you or we'll go through something else that might better fit your needs. We've got tons of options. Okay, so let's go through this list because there's a list. It's funny, when I started using QuickBooks, there's like four things here. Invoices, multiple invoices, import invoices. What I was saying is if you run big reports in QuickBooks Online, get to the point, Katie. At some point, it'll say there's too many rows. You have to download this into Excel. And you can do that. Download it into Excel to review your report. Make sure you have very strong bandwidth or use the desktop app for QuickBooks Online if you have a lot of volume and you're routinely doing these reports. And if you're running into current constant issues, talk to us about enterprise, okay? Payments. Estimates. Sales receipts. Credit memo. Refund receipt. Delayed credit. Delayed charge, okay? Uh, I can't see the one at the very bottom. Let's see if I can scroll down. Time activity, there you go. Okay, so I'm not gonna touch on all these because the last section was 35 minutes. So hope y'all got yourself some cocoa. I got my tea because this is gonna be a long one, guys. But um, we're gonna go ahead and get into invoices. Okay, so we've made it into our invoice screen. And I'm just gonna pick a customer, all right? And we're gonna test RevRec here, okay? But um, I just wanna show you how you do an invoice. So if you wanna do an invoice, let's go ahead and touch on that real quick. You pick your customer, you put your customer email, online payments, remember I told you you have the option and it allows you to set a global option in your preferences as well. Once you have this turned on, what's your billing address, your shipping address, what are your terms, what's your invoice date? And keep in mind, you see this terms, you and me set this up when we are in the preferences. Okay, do I want this invoice to be recurring? So if instead of doing like a $1,200 invoice for a year subscription, what if I wanna do $100 every month? You can do that and you don't even need RevRec, okay? Just set up one invoice for $100. But if you offer annual subscriptions, you're gonna need RevRec. Revenue recognition. I have to stop using acronyms. Uh, what I'm doing this. Do I need shipping instructions? Do I have a carrier that I already have I need to send? Or does my customer, you know, depending on the FOB and what, what their setup is, who's paying or who's doing the shipping? Shipping date, tracking number, location, serial number, which is not printed on the form per the directions, shipping from, tags, okay, and manage your tags. And again, we'll get to tags. And then here's one where uh, I picked this one and it looks like somebody had an existing estimate for it. I'm not going to add it, but if you wanted, you could add it. If you have like a lot of travel that you do on behalf of customers and you need to add all of that, uh, you can filter you know, for time periods and things like that, what kind of times the time or estimates and so on, and you can add that from the right side. My office pupper is behind me, so you get to say hi to Rocky. Anyway. Service date, 
These columns we all set up in preferences. If you prefer something simpler for entry, you can absolutely have that. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to pick, actually, I picked, I set up a new item so that we could do the reference thing. Okay. Subscription. Okay. You see where I've done this? Subscription. Ha! You wonder where I got the 1200 from. Yes, I prepared. So, uh, subscription, uh, we go ahead and put our description in. For this, we're doing a RevRec example. The most common use case I could think of was for subscriptions. There's tons of use cases for this. There's actually a help document in the QuickBooks Knowledge Base that goes over RevRec and how you use it. So, um, if you need more information on that, I'll, uh, you can do that. So, your service date is very important to this activity. I'm going to put 8 1, and I'm going to put my class. Okay, did you get those so silly? I have to go fix those. All right, so we've got all this in here. We've got RevRec right here, okay? Now, you may wonder why it doesn't say RevRec. It's because we set up RevRec in the item, and I will actually show you how you do that when we get to items. All right, set and close. Oh gosh, you're deciding to be goofy now. Oh my goodness. So, when I want to take a look at the RevRec schedule, there's two things we can do. We can go down to reports. Okay, if you can hear that, ignore the goofball behind me. He is in full zoomy mode on the floor. Picked perfect timing. All right, so if that went too fast, I did go to reports. Rev recognition report. And there you go. You'll notice some of the reports that QuickBooks has have this new format. Okay, I think I did a video a while back on custom reporting, so the new custom reporting module, and what I'm seeing is the new reporting format they're using looks just like that module. So I think they're kind of integrating it all together. Um, and so what this RevRec report looks like is, it looks, so you can see right here, is this one that I did? No, this is one somebody else did. So this was our build amount. And this is what we recognized at the time of the invoice, and this is what we deferred, okay? And it just follows down. You see this? So it builds your whole RevRec schedule for you. Absolutely yeah. fantastic, okay? And so what you'll notice is like there's these numbers, because there was two in here before we started today. Um, and mine was dated for mid-year. So you can see there's one amount, one invoice for RevRec, one, 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 one. Then in July, it went to two, okay, RevRec. This is the one that I did here the other, uh, earlier today and what it does is well I'll go through it in a minute but basically you set up a mapping and you say this is what I use for my deferred income account or my deferred revenue account this is where I want you to uh, link the recognized revenue to for this item and then it does all these calculations on the back end and automates it and I will say after 20 years in the business 23 years in the business um, huge relief love it okay Moving on. Okay, so where were we? We were under invoices. I think I touched on invoicing for the most part. There, you can make invoices memorized. You can make them recurring. Um, there's a lot of different options for invoices. I will probably touch on that a lot when we go through the gear. Let's see where we're going. Where's our recurring, recurring transactions? We'll touch on a lot of that under recurring transactions. Okay, so we're just not there yet. All right, so invoices we've touched on. And again, I'll show you this drop down here one more time. Multiple invoices. Do you want to import invoices? Awesome. Because um, up till recently, you actually had to buy um, software for that if you needed to import invoices. So let's see. Customers. We've got, if you use QuickBooks Desktop, this looks like your money bar. It's basically the money bar. Do we organize sub customers as projects? Okay, you can convert the first level sub customers in their own projects. A lot of people do that, right? So we'll set up a customer, say if Walmart was my customer and then the retail centers were my um, projects or whatever, you can go ahead and do that, whatever you need to do. Or you do multiple projects for the same customer and it looks like it's gonna ask if we wanna convert it. Which ones do you wanna convert? This is a one-time conversion, you can do it anytime, we'll move all the link transactions with it. So I'm just going to hit convert. Okay. 
I cannot say enough about how I love the shout, or I just want to do the shout out about how much easier this program has been to use and how it's adding all these really cool features. And you do have to be a little patient sometimes if something doesn't work the way that you want it to, but it's an investment in where you're going. And most businesses or a lot of businesses are going to be using QuickBooks their whole life cycle. Okay, so we have customer types. Where did I, what was I doing that I started working on customer types? Oh, it was right there. So if you notice the but, buttons, customer types, a lot of people use this for like wholesale would be one customer type, retail would be another customer type. If you do like Facebook sales, Instagram sales, you want to do, you know, track them differently. You could use customer types. There's other ways to do it too and so forth. It's another way to slice and dice your customers. Okay. And import customers, multiple customers. Okay. Customers. So we've kind of touched on customers. Well, you know, we haven't touched on editing the customers, have we? All right, I always pick on this one. I'm gonna change the name because I always use this one on my demo and I don't know where this name came from. Test customer. Okay, so this is what your name and contact screen looks like. Okay, here's your phone number. Here's your billing address. Uh, if you have different shipping address, you can fill that out. Any notes and attachments, okay? There's your attachment. So if you have like a proposal you use for the customer, do your colleagues a favor, upload it. What kind of payment they typically use? Do you wanna store the payment information? Is bank encrypted? Bank level encrypted terms? That they typically, here you go. I typically do net 15 with this customer. How do I want my sales form to go through? What language do we wanna use? What kind of customer are they? Is this customer tax exempt? Be very careful when selecting that. Uh, make sure you get any tax exemption certificates on file before you actually just jump in and mark them tax exempt. Select your tax rate based on location. This one has the automated, I think it has the automated sales tax turned on, which is another big win. So I'll touch base on that later if it is turned on. If not, we'll go ahead and turn it on. And then these are the custom fields, which again, we'll talk about custom fields. Do they have insurance on file? And um, it looks like these are somebody, something, someone else has entered these, but like delivery dates, delivery details, serial numbers, you can add custom fields from here. Okay, but again, we're gonna go through it later. I'm trying to keep myself in one direction. Wow, it sounds like a band or something. Okay, moving on. So we've got our transaction list. We've already gone through how it's set up right here. We've gone through that part. We go through projects, if they have any projects assigned. You see that? So under projects, we'll touch on projects later, but you'll see income, you'll see costs, profit margin, time, and the rest. Okay, there you go. Customer details, we've just done, we've just done the edit, so you get to see all that good stuff that you would have edited any late fees, um, it says you need to turn them on, and any notes, which also let us do in the edit screen. Okay, and if you wanna pin a note, you can pin a note. Do you wanna do an invoice? Do you wanna do payment, estimate, sales receipt, credit memo, delay, charge, time activity, or statement? Okay, what well, I keep coming back to it. You can, do mul you can do a lot of features. They're very intuitive. They plug your hyperlinks to all your features wherever they think that you're gonna to have to come up with it. Okay. Okay, so we've talked through what the customer looks like. We've talked through entering an invoice. We will do, yes, we can do um, receive payment next. Uh, products and services. Let me get through products and services. As promised, I was going to show you how we set up that RevRec example. Okay. So let's do revenue recognition tests. So I set this up, you, I made it a service item and put in revenue recognition test. You could put subscription, whatever you need to. Actually, I think I did the subscription one. So let me, okay, same thing, that was fine. I sell this product service to my customers. If you have a description for your sales form, you put it there. Sales price and rate is $1,200. Where do you see income account of services? Is it taxable or not? Again, check the rate, the rules of your state. Do you have any price rules? Oh, bless. I clicked it. Let me X out. Now, see, see what I did? See what I did? That's why I don't click links when I'm working on trying to show people things. 
get back where we were. All right. Okay, revenue recognition. So this is where we set this up. I recognize revenue for this monthly. It pulled that from the preferences we set up earlier. What's my liability account? Unearned revenue. Length of time you're providing this service. I put for 12 months. Okay, so it's gonna um, accrue it over the course of 12 months, right? And if you pr purchased it from a vendor, you could click there. Uh, and it makes what's called a double-sided item, which just means uh, you're tracking expenses and revenue on that item. Uh, let's see. Let's see. So that's RevRec right there. We've got our sales kind of done. We're going to go back to products and services, but we're going to do that. Oh, we just did products and services. Let's go ahead and add a new item. So when you go into products and services, you now have several options, okay? You have inventory, non-inventory, service, and bundles. Okay, bundles used to be groups. So if you're used to it being called groups, never fear, it's just now a bundle, all right? Inventory is gonna track your quantity on hand. You can see the screen here where it says initial quantity on hand. That's going to put the other side, I believe, to opening balance equity, which is our trash account. You will always wanna make sure that account has a zero balance, always. It's on your equity portion of your balance sheet. Go look now, make sure yours does. Um, but basically when you're setting up a file, you may use it for some temporary balances, but you need to change it or clear it out once you're done. As of date, what's my reorder point? And again, I've said it already, if you use an e-commerce system, a point of sale system, make sure you're checking with whatever systems you have hooked up to your file to make sure everything's set up the way they want it set up so you're not double counting inventory or causing some issue or, and so forth, okay? And then who's our preferred vendor? If you have QuickBooks Enterprise, you can also do alternate vendors. You can't do that in this one here yet. And you can now also set up an image. Okay, so let's hit new again. Now let's do non-inventory. So if I don't need to track stock, but I want to track what I sold in it and maybe what I bought in it, but I don't track it as inventory, that's a non-inventory item, okay? That's not gonna hit my assets and so forth. And something to say about cash basis businesses and inventory. A lot of people think, because I'm cash based businesses, business, I don't track inventory, okay? Talk to your tax people about it. But what you call that is a non-incidental um, inventory. So basically in a cruel basis, you track, track inventory. But you also have something called non-incidental materials. Um, that you can track as cash-based business to track your inventory, and that's something you would talk to your tax person about. So under non-inventory, you put your name, your SKU, your category, your class, description, sales price, income account, taxable or not. You can, it's so tempting to hit that button. If you take me somewhere else, okay, okay. So then um, if you click that button, you can say, what category am I? You know, what is this item? and is it taxable or non-taxable? And then it says the tax rules you set here will be apply every time you add this to an invoice, okay? So let's hit new again. So we covered non-inventory service items. And one thing I didn't, I touched on, but I don't know if you caught it. So you have something called single-sided items and non, or and double-sided items. This goes all the way back to desktop, okay? Basically, single-sided is I just sell it to customers don't need to track anything else. If you do job costing, if you buy from vendors and need to track the cost, things like that, you need what's called a double-sided item. And uh, so that's when you click the button that says, I buy it from a vendor. And there's times where you don't buy it from a vendor, but you still have to use that toggle. Uh, but if you have questions about that feature, just let me know, okay? Service is very self-explanatory. It's the simplest item you can have, okay? So you have your service item here and you've got your RevRec turned on. There was not a RevRec option for inventory items, okay? Not that I remember, anyway. Bundle, the bundle is a group item. So it kind of has a bomb, right? Or not like B-O-M-B, -B, but B-O-M, uh, Bill of Materials, but it's, uh, it's a bundle. So if you sell something and then um, you, it's actually got a bunch of stuff, but you're not assembling it, like it's not like a kit where you're assembling things to turn into something else, right? This is truly like a bundle, like maybe a gift basket or something. Um, or, hey, if you buy this nifty computer, I will throw in this really cool mouse for free, you know, bundle. Uh, then you would use this feature. Cancel. Okay. I think that was all my item types. 
Okay, let's see more. We can manage categories. So with your inventory, you can have categories like perishables, non-perishables, you know, and the rest of it. Whatever your categories are, you can use it. You can run a report on your inventory and you can do your price rules. In the interest of time, I'm not gonna touch on these because I'm pretty sure we're going to make this a healthy demo and it doesn't need my help by going into every single button. Um, but I will, if you have questions about it, hit me up and I'll do a separate video. So I think that's sales. Let's go ahead and go over to expenses overview. And it's basically the reverse of sales, okay? All right, here's what my spend is over time. I hope that's not what it is. Uh, somebody needs to make us a budget. So, uh, oh, look at that, insights. Your spending increased. I could tell you right now that if I was looking at this and I was seeing something, I'd be like, okay, what's going on here? <sighs> okay. I could go on a tangent now about how important planning is, but I won't do that because I'm going to put people to sleep. So do I need to do a workflow for my spending tasks? Do I have bills that I need a uh, approval on, reminders and notifications and so forth? Okay, not right now, but I love this overview. Now with this side, you can do bills, checks, expense, bill receipt, upload, purchase orders, vendor credit, batch transactions, time activity, and pay down my credit card. Pay down credit card doesn't actually go onto your, bank, your credit card website and pay it down. It just shows that you're paying your credit card in your books. Uh, they used to call it something else. And I think uh, for ease of reading and, and to remove ambiguity, they changed it. And uh, my throat's getting sore. Do I want to run a report? Profit, loss, aging summary, balance sheet, and custom reports. Do I need to print a check? Do I need to use spreadsheet sync? Do I need to add a budget? Do I need to manage users, create workflows, employee expense claims? Okay. Expenses. Okay. Okay. We've got this. We're doing great. So this is just a tabular thing with your expenses. Here's a little trick that I do in my office. You can do it for you if you want. A lot of people forget to track their backup for their transactions, okay? So it's easy to go out there and run your business and forget, hey, I need to track my receipts. I need to track the backup for my transactions or what we call source documents. Um, so what I typically do is we have somebody in the office whose job is to make sure that we have backup for all our transactions. So what I do is I change this and it is sticky. When you go back in, I'll still be there. And I say show attachment. And this is, I'm sure there's much more sophisticated ways of doing this, but this is what I do. And I turn that on and we make sure to attach document back up to every single one. Now I know that if I look at this dashboard and I look down this row, if something doesn't have a paper clip, it will usually show a number. Is there one document, two documents, three documents, so on. If there's no document listed here, I need to attach back up to that transaction. You know, so you've got your source documents taken care of. You can also print checks here. A lot of people don't use this feature anymore, but uh, I do, I will say I do. Uh, and if you do too, uh, that's where you would go. I'll try to touch on that here in a minute. Expense claims. This is new and it's obviously in beta. And I'll be honest with you, I have not seen this yet. So we're gonna learn together. Here's your new home for employee expenses. Invite your team to submit their expenses for review so you can add them straight to your books. And you can learn more if you click the little button. I'm not clicking the button. We've learned our lesson there, right? New expense claim, upload receipt or enter manually. So let's see, 100, I need to be reimbursed for $100. What's my transaction date? Who was my vendor? Let's see if there's a G, let's see if there's an R. Okay, let's just put in staples, see if it'll come up. Category, none, customer and project, test customer and you wouldn't have to do customer if it was not billable and so on but still here's my class here's my location business purpose uh, office supplies submit for review okay I actually don't know where that just went because I don't know who we have set up to do reviews in this in this one but um, there you go we got an expense claim let's see and it doesn't show up here, so it's obviously been sent for review to somebody. Somebody in my office has now gotten an email saying someone needs you to approve this. Uh, 
Okay, here we go. Review. Let's see. Payee, bank credit account, ops. Here we go. Transaction date. We don't have to pay. It's not required. Okay. Remember what I said? Yeah, sometimes I do that. Okay. That should be office supplies. It's funny. I thought we filled it out with another one. And if we have a split, we could do that. Hit save it close. Okay. Perfect. So that's expense claims. I'm wondering if it puts it under a bill. Let's put it under a bill once it's approved. No. It's interesting. I need to see where that goes. So it's reviewed. We just reviewed it. Okay. So it said, oh, okay. So here you go. It says create an expense. Ah, new expense added. So now it's been entered as an expense. Bills. Okay. So no bills to review. Unpaid. So if you had bill approval set up, you, it would be under for a review. If it's unpaid, you've got them here. If it's paid, it's here. They used to integrate with, I think, Melio, and they've also integrated bill.com, I think, in the past. Um, I know that went away. I think they're replacing it with their own QuickBooks bill pay now. So stay tuned. I don't know that that's live quite yet because it right at the time of this recording, they're in the middle of doing all that. Okay, add bill. Upload from computer, create a bill, create a recurring bill. Do I need to manage my recurring bills? We're gonna to touch on a lot of these recurring transactions in our gear, so I will not go through that. And these are the ones we've paid. Vendors. Okay, this is very similar to customers, so I'm not spending a ton of time on it. I will say that if you have 1099 vendors, it will let you upload their 1099 information. Track payments for 1099. If you have contractors, uh, you can actually ask them to add their own if you had if you have a subscription to the it's like you can get it standalone uh, for the 1099s but it's a form of QuickBooks payroll I think it's ten dollars a month at the mo at, at the moment and it'll ask them to set up all their own 1099 information you don't have to worry about it so if you have a lot of contractors that might be something to keep in mind you can also direct deposit their contractor pay okay so I'm just going to scroll through this little bit this is all very typical information you can add your attachments I know like one thing that I've used the custom fields for in the past is like if you work uh, if you're a contractor you need workers comp insurance certificates from your vendors uh, you can add a custom field here for that in desktop I think it comes already in this in the contractor edition but you can also do that with a custom field and just upload it any certificate okay so we went through that, we edited that, we looked on our new transaction, we've done time, okay, we did, we're not gonna cover all this today. Okay, bill expense, check, purchase order, vendor credit, okay. Contractors, so we talked about it. Contractor is a subset of the vendors, okay? You can see W9 is ready for this person. You can pay them with direct deposit, okay? Let's see, that's all under contractor payments. Mileage, download your client's trip log, okay? You can, um, oh, something super important about uh, mileage that I probably need to talk about. So mileage, it will track your trips on the app, okay? It's fantastic, actually. You have to have some privacy settings adjusted because it has to track your location. Um, so use it if you want, don't use it, whatever. But uh, don't believe that it automatically posts it. What you need to do is at the end of the year, you want, or whatever period, you download your trip log and you enter those transactions as a journal entry, okay? That's really important to know, okay? So we've gone through expenses, expense claims, bills, vendors, contractors, mileage. Let's look under the quick create. Yeah, I think we're gonna touch on a lot of these forms when we get to the quick create button, so I'm not gonna go through all those different types of transactions. Next, we're gonna go through your reports. Okay. Okay. You have standard reports, custom reports, management reports, and spreadsheet sync. I will try my best to demo all of these, but as you can tell, um, we are kind of we are kind of getting into it. But this is what happens, right? I do these videos, and then somebody goes, "I wish you would have touched more on this." So what we decided this time is I'm going to touch on as much as I can. 
and then we're going to break it out into chapters so you can skip around. Um, but uh, it's going to be a doozy. So with that being said, actually, let me take a quick break before we jump into reports and I'll be right back. And you probably won't even notice. Hey guys, I am back. I am a time traveler. I just went ahead and had my lunch. I am refreshed and we are jumping into reports now. There are four different kinds of reports. You've got standard reports, custom reports, management reports, and spreadsheet sync. Standard reports are the oldies and the goodies. Those are the ones that have been around uh, for a quite a while, but they're always being added to. So that's uh, uh, usually when you're looking for a report, that's typically where I start. Um, you can actually customize these too. And when you customize them, and I'll show you how to do that, they will show up here under your custom reports. Okay? Okay? And we'll talk about this in depth in a minute. Management reports, typically they're, you can create a management report of your own, but it's usually where you're having to do like a presentation or a packet and you need it to be very uh, presentable. And it allows you to kind of do a cover page here and a table of contents and uh, your preliminary. So if you're like creating an auditor's report or you're creating something for investors and you just want to kind of go that extra mile, you'll go ahead and do your management reports. Okay. Let's go ahead and take a look at your basic company financials one. So we have a management report for the period ended December 31st. And you can see that's prepared by, and all this is pre-populated because it is a template. Here's your table of contents. And it's got your uh, profit and loss balance sheet. If you are a bookkeeper or an accountant, this might be a really cool way to send financials at the end of the month uh, to kind of add that extra polish. Thank you. I can talk. Okay. Moving on from management reports, that's really kind of all there is to see under management reports. Uh, you also have spreadsheet sync, which I will attempt to demonstrate on this video. I did not prepare to demonstrate spreadsheet sync, so we may have to finagle it a little bit. But basically spreadsheet sync, uh, you can create like dashboards, you can create like mass updates. You can see like, like a two-way sync here, which is how most people use it. You can also do multi-company reports in spreadsheets, okay? Um, so we'll go ahead and try to do a little bit with that, but I'm not going to dive in too deep. So we're going to go with standard reports for, for now. Uh, we talked about how QuickBooks lets you access things in more than one way. You can actually use the scroll here. You can scroll here for what you're looking for if you want. You can also click up here at your magnifying glass and you put in what you're looking for which is a really cool use case. I, for some reason, always had in my head it was transactions that you search for there. And then I was working with one of my colleagues here at Certum, and they used it to pull up a report. And I was like, whoa, because I'm the one that goes, here, which one is it that I need? And then I favored it, so I know where to find it next time. Speaking of which, you've got favorites. So we'll go through this. Custom Report Builder. QuickBooks came out with the Custom Report Builder probably about a year ago, I think. I'm not 100% sure. You can go ahead and create a new report or you can use any of these reports here. The Revenue Recognition Report, I think we touched on earlier, but I'll just touch on that again. Um, this is the one that creates your revenue recognition schedule, okay? And you can notice, if you notice, let's go back to that. You see this tabular format, the way it looks like this. You can tell those are the new reports by that look. Uh, the older reports, like I'm used to, uh, like our PL, let's see if it'll come up, looks like this. Okay. There's no wrong way. I believe eventually all the reports will look the new way, but for now, this is how it is. Um, operationally, it's very similar. Uh, so. I won't worry about too much about nuance there, but we'll go ahead and scroll through here. Under your custom report builder, builder it gives you a, a selection of reports that you can use to create your own custom reports, okay? Then you move down to favorites. Favorites are ones where you see these green stars. If I have a report that I like and I do a green star, it will now show up under my favorites, okay? The ones that say new enhanced experience, obviously they've kind of touched those reports up a little bit. I do not have the time or the bandwidth to go through every single report in this list, so I'm going to go through the sections and then touch on some of the more frequently used reports. 
business overview, audit logs. Um, so that's a really critical report that a lot of people don't know exists. If for some reason you need to see who oops done something, you can access your audit log there. Also, if it's a certain transaction, you can hit more at the bottom and look at the audit log and I'll tell you who uh, accidentally goofed the transaction or what have you, but that's a really cool report. Um, and there's a lot of, let's see, we're gonna click the button. Cause I know I'm gonna have to go back, but I just wanna show you this to you. All users, okay? So if Christy was here, uh, I'd go ahead and change it to Christy and then I could see what she's done. Obviously, Christy's not been in here. So we go in all users, you can see I've been very busy, um, as to be expected. And it looks like our cast manager has been in here as well. So um, you can kind of see that. You can filter it for users. You can win see when things were changed and what events were happened. Did someone delete something? Did somebody change the list? Now the list one's super interesting and permissions changes actually, because in desktop you historically could not track people who changed list items or permissions. So the fact that that's even there is awesome. And I don't believe you could do data exchange either. So look at that, or budgets. I don't think you could do budgets, um, budget changes. So. But that's your audit log. I like to highlight that one because nobody knows it exists. And if you go up here to the gear, you can actually also access it under your tools. So that's less that we have to cover later. Okay, so under, let's see, business overview, you've got your audit log, balance sheets, your budget overview, we'll go through budgeting, your business snapshot, uh, custom summary reports, if you want to build a report, your P&L, which, PL as percent of total income, you can actually achieve that with the regular PL and just hit vertical analysis. There's like a vertical analysis button in there you can click. PL detail, PL by class, you can actually get to that one by drilling down on your end, on your net income or loss on your PL too. So a lot of these are just really different flavors of the same report, where like profit and loss is the main one. And depending on how you customize it, you come up with the rest of them. Okay, project profitability summary is interesting. Um, if you use projects, quarterly profit and loss summary, again, you can do that with the regular profit and loss, but it's nice to have it in the menu. Statement of cash flows, who owes you? So our AR aging detail, aging summary, collections reports, balance sheet, or customer balance detail, which is a personal favorite because like the aging is awesome, but it's very, again, tabular. So it gives you a good overview, but if you're kind of trying to look at the transactional level detail, the customer balance detail is epic. Customer balance summary, your invoice list, invoices and receive payments, open invoices, statement list, terms list, which we talked about terms earlier. Uh, this will show you the terms that you've set up unbilled charges and unbilled time. If you work with billable transactions, these are critical reports for you, okay? So I'll go ahead and pick unbilled charges includes unbilled time. So if you do travel and services for a customer and it's billable, it will, they will both be on the charges report, only the time will be on the time report, okay? See, so you can see right here unbilled charges. So what I like to use this for is if you're billing a client and you're in professional services, uh, you can go through the invoices and bill each client for their for their amounts, but you can use this report to make sure you didn't miss anybody. You know what I mean? Okay, so let's go back. Let's see. I know I'm going to get people saying, I wish you would have drilled down on this one report more, but I've, I'm already at an hour and a half and I'm thinking this is going to be hefty, so I just want to make sure that I hit in the important stuff. Balance sheet, okay. If I was looking at this, I'd go, you've got a lot of negative balances on this account, um, but that's fine. This is a test file. I tell people, this is the one you get to blow up. Make your mistakes in this one, but that way you don't make them in your other one. Liabilities and equity numbers there, assets is there. Uh, if those don't match, you probably have a problem with your file. Make sure you reach out to us. This is where I'm like, display columns by quarters. You can do the same thing for a P&L, and there you're, you're, you've got your quarterly P&L report that it lists as a different report. Uh, select another period. You can do previous period, previous, and you can do dollar and percentage, percent of row, percent of column. Percent of column will give you the one against revenue, like we were talking about. If you want to do non-zero rows, which is a common filter that I set up, uh, that's a really good filter to do. Non-zero columns, I'm not exactly sure. You'd have to have some some classes and stuff set up for that to be applicable. So let's look at your P&L. 
We talk about P&Ls all the time because why? Because that's where your revenue is recorded. So everybody gets excited about it. Okay, here's your P&L. It's the same thing. You can set your report period. You've got plenty of dates. And if it, you don't find one that matches exactly what you want, you can always do custom. Display columns by total days, weeks, months, etc. Non-zero active rows and columns is very similar to the balance sheet. Select your period, okay? What's your accounting method? So we talked about in preferences how important it is to set up the correct accounting period for your books. But if you're like looking at say a cash-based report and you're like, I really kind of want to look at my revenue based on the invoice dates, you can always toggle it to accrual and this is not going to affect your books as a whole. It's just going to affect your reports. So you can toggle that back and forth, okay? Then if I wanted to customize this, and this is the same for all the reports, okay? The selections here may be slightly different, but you can customize most, if not all, of the reports in QuickBooks Online. You can go ahead and say, I really prefer to see this year to last month, and I kind of want to look at that on a regular basis. In fact, let's do this, this year to last month. Say, I have, I have certain doing my books. I know my books are caught up as close to real time as possible. I just really want to look at my performance for the entire year, end it for last month, and kind of take a look at it every month, okay? Hypothetical. Could be you. Anyway, rows and columns, you want to go ahead and do columns. Do I want to change my column? Maybe put, what was my performance last year at this time, and what was the percent change? Because be honest with you, I am always more, I'm usually more interested in the percent change because dollars aren't, are, they're just dollars. It's all numbers at the end of the day, honestly. A percent change tells me really how tangible and how impactful our performance has been. Filter, um, do I want to look at a specific customer, vendor, employee? So if you have a customer and you're not using projects and you kind of want to see what your profitability is for them, you could actually filter this for customers. Same thing with vendors. There's more than one way to do most reports. Show your logo, because I want it fancy, because that's what I am. No, I'm kidding. I'm not. I'm 100% not. I'm cleaning out a chicken coop tomorrow. <laughs> so moving on, run report. And then we've got uh, our logo. I can even add some notes. This is one really cool report. Actually, in all actuality, I would probably put report for internal use only or just internal use only okay like don't go give this to your banker if we you know if you haven't reviewed it in full you don't just send like a, a regular report like this so edit your titles Let's see, income, cost of goods sold. Look at this, you can change all your titles here, which is kind of interesting because it makes you think about, you could, the nonprofit edition of QuickBooks is basically QuickBooks regular with different terminology. So um, I just think that's interesting. Technically you could kind of go in here and change some of your terminology. So that'd be cool. Um, so maybe, here's one, I don't know how often you would really feel the need to do this, but some people, if you're in services, you might call it cost of services instead of goods. So you could actually change it to that. Okay, save. All right, now you know what? I've, I've done all this work to get this report set up. I really just want it to save for me. Katie's version. And I'm going to add it to a group if you want. See, Jennifer put Jennifer's report, but we're going to call new group name. I'm going to do Katie's report. Kapow. And you can share it with your firm only. You can share it with your uh, with everybody, uh, which, okay. So because I'm an accountant and I'm in the uh, version I access from my accountant, I can do firm only, or you, if you're, if I want my customer to see it too, I can go ahead and hit all. Okay. So yours will probably be different. Okay. So then we've got it under, we've got it saved. Okay. Now watch this. Watch this. I'm going to make magic happen. Customer reports. Oh, I remember doing that. Okay. Hold on. Katie's reports. It's been grouped, right? Where are you, friend? Did I not put it under there? Did I not save it? <gasps> Did I not save it? I could have sworn I saved it. You know what? I don't know that I saved it. Oh, there we go. I think I accidentally added the group, but I didn't add it to the group. Okay. All right. So 
There you go. So if we have a group of reports, uh, it's going to set, it's going to follow the schedule. So that is set for the group, not the report. If the report is not in a group, you can set its own schedule. So for this one, like if I had Katie's reports, I'd have all the reports Katie wants to see at the beginning of every month. And I'd say like bank, bank feeds or bank statements come in like the second, give them to the 10th to get everything reconciled. I want to see these around the 15th, right? So I can actually edit my schedule. Oh, bless what I do. There. Okay. What did I do? Okay. Ignore me. Okay. So I hit edit. I, I hit edit and I got into the email schedule. I really don't know what I did. And I'd hit monthly every one month on the 15th. Okay. And I don't ever want this to end. And I'm just going to put in kgbdemo at gmail.com because I do not want to get this report every month. Um, and so I could put here, Goofy, these are the reports that you set up for yourself. And you can even have attach as an Excel file if I want to do anything in Excel with it. Okay. Now every month it's going to send these to me. All right. So that saves me setting the schedule for every individual report and I can get my reporting packet every month. All right. So let's go back to standard reports. Where were we? We're under business overview. Okay. We're going to go over budgets. Don't let me forget to do budgets. So then we go to who owes you. So we have our ARs here that we talked about. Okay. Sales and customers. Okay. You've got your inventory value, valuation detail on desktop. I think it's called a stock valuation report, stock status report. One of those. Some of the terminology is slightly different. Sales and customers. It's funny, I would have put that under an inventory section, but that's okay. You've got an inventory worksheet here and the rest of it. And I know I've said it a hundred times. Make sure that you're paying attention to how your third parties ask you to connect to QuickBooks. What do you owe people? So if you've marked people for 1099s and things like that, you can track what you owe them, your balance detail, balance summary, and the rest. Bills and applied payments, unpaid bills, vendor balance detail, and so on. Expenses and vendors. Okay, we've got your transaction detail report, open purchase orders, purchases by class, purchases by location, and so forth. Okay, sales tax. We'll get to sales tax in a minute, but if you want to see your sales tax liability, taxable sales detail, taxable summary. Employees, you've got your employee contact list, recent time activities, time activities by employee detail. Okay. For my accountant, we've got our account list with a, I'm pretty sure the chart of accounts, but they call it an account list, adjusted trial balance, and so on, balance sheet. Then we've got our class list, which we're going to take a look at in another section, exceptions to closing dates. So this is a great report too, okay? People wonder, sometimes you may not see this. If you don't see this report, it's because you've never reconciled your books and that's a problem, okay? Once you reconcile your books for the first time, Anytime somebody uses that closing date password that we went into in the preferences and they change a prior transaction, it will pop up on your exceptions to closing date report. How's that helpful? Well, for several reasons. I want to know who in the office changed those transactions. Goofies. And secondly, uh, if I have a beginning balance discrepancy when I do my bank reconciliation, I can use this report to help me figure it out. But they also do a very good job of coaching you through tracking down what it is. A journal, uh, the journal report, which is uh, very common, used to be extremely common in accounting. People don't use it as much as they used to. It was basically a log of all your transactions. General ledger, and so on. Let's see here. Profit and loss by tag group. We're going to cover that. Recent automatic transactions. Reconciliation reports. So again, another place to find those. Recurring templates, another place to find those. Uh, transaction detail by account, which is probably one of my top five reports I use. And then you've got your transaction list with splits and your trial balance, which is also really common. Then under payroll, we have limited payroll reports here, but you would have a lot more if we had an active payroll set up on this one. Okay, so that's standard reports, custom reports, management reports. All that's left is spreadsheet sync, performance center, and create new reports. So let's try creating a new report. Okay, what kind of report do I want? Uh, pick invoice report great and then it brings it up here okay now I'm gonna pick this year try to see if I can't get um, 
more activity. Okay, now let's see what chart view gives us. Check that out. Wah! So we all love a good bar chart, right? Anyway, if you didn't think I was a nerd before, no, I'm kidding. Um, so you can do your bar chart, you can do a trend line, you can do a stacked bar, okay? Brings me back to Excel class. Getting the feels, I'm kidding. Okay, okay, so you've got your horizontal and vertical axes. Okay, we can do columns. Like I said, blow it up. Okay, if I want to filter it by invoice information, change my dates, I can export it to PDF or PNG. So like if I want to do like an image of it, maybe for Excel or some other use, you could actually do that or you could take a screenshot too. But um, you can add it to your performance center. Look at this. You can add it to, and we didn't touch on performance center. And I know I talked about dashboards before and how it's kind of click and drag. Performance center, that's actually really cool because I did not know you could now add it to your performance center. So maybe we can do a more custom dashboard there. We'll check that out. Do I want to add it to my management report? So there you go. See, those are newer. So what is it I read? I actually was reading um, an article the other day because that's basically what I do. Uh, I do a lot of reading um, when I'm not working. So, and it actually talked about you learn 25% of what you read. No, and I'm going to get this wrong. I'm paraphrasing. Okay. Don't hold me to it. Something like 20, 25% of what you read, you remember 50% of what you hear. And it's something like you remember 90% of what you either experience or you see. I think it was C. So when I do these demos, it actually helps me to become a better accountant because I get to go find all the things that I don't see on a normal basis and, um, and that can be really helpful for me and my clients. Okay. All right. So we've done, let's see, we just did reports. Okay. So now let's do our performance center. You saw how to create a custom report. Obviously there's more to it than that if you're really digging in for specific information, but you kind of get the idea. So I'm going to put in accounting. Let's just put other accounting services. All right, so here's our performance center. So this really is kind of a dashboard and it looks to be kind of closer to what you get with something like Power BI. I'm sure it's not quite at that level, but um, you can, it picks up your industry. And this is really cool because uh, I wanna know, is it benchmarking for me? Because if you use Live Plan and you put in your NAICS code, uh, it will actually do some benchmarking for you, like shows you what others in your industry do based on what's in, um, based on their databases or based on publicly accessible databases. How do you use this information? Here we go. Industry for specific type or location. So it's actually pulling from my location and my industry type. I'm not seeing as pulling my ratios. That's pretty cool. Quick ratio, my net profit, gross profit, APAR. Wow. Ooh, somebody needs to space that out. Hmm. I'm not seeing the benchmarking, but it looks like it, it infers, it kind of insinuates that it does benchmarking. So it might be that it doesn't have that information. Aha! Okay, here we go. Okay, net profit. Here's per industry, gross profit margin by industry. 93.82% and so forth. Okay, so here's your benchmarking. So it does some benchmarking, that's really cool. Okay, perfect. So you've got this performance center, which which it seems to be extremely, extremely helpful. And I am ashamed to say I really haven't used it that much in the past, but guess who's about to start? Okay, so we've covered the performance center. Um, we've covered general reports. What are we doing next? I tell you what, I'm going to take a quick break and we'll go ahead and pick this up. 
We just went ahead and did reports and we're gonna jump over into payroll. Now, if you had QuickBooks payroll, you would actually have uh, a lot more built out here. You can use the workforce app so people can see their pay stubs and their W-2 information. You have, you can do that for contractors too. You can see on this contractor piece, you have pay with direct deposit, see what their last payment is, add a contractor and so on. And you have workers comp tab. You also like with elite payroll, you have an HR center and a bunch of other stuff. It's really cool. I love QuickBooks payroll. Make sure that you talk to our team if you have any questions about which tier is right for you. We will go ahead and click on employees and I'll show you how the employee section looks. Okay, it's just contact information because we don't have it set up. Uh, you would also have a button under here that says payroll settings if you had payroll turned on, but we don't. So that being said, I'm gonna jump over to QuickBooks time, okay? So when I click on time, it says overview, do you wanna launch your QuickBooks time account? We're gonna go ahead and do that, okay? I know there's probably an issue with payroll mappings, but we're gonna move on. Now this one looks a little bit different because it's got, you know, it's our, it's our uh, demo account. But you've got, you know, our team listed here. Here's the schedule. I'm just gonna go through these buttons real quick, okay? So you can go over to your time clock, who's on and off the clock, if you want people to see that. You can then go to a schedule, okay? What's the schedule? You can do projects. What's our profitability by project? You know, what's our budget here and so on? Okay. Who's working right now, which we already touched on, okay? Where's our time entries? If we had people using the time entries, we could. This also does work with a kiosk and other different ways of entering your time, like your mobile phone and so on. Here's your manual time card. Here's a time slider. Uh, here's your time sheets. Time off requests, okay? Any accruals and balances. Any approvals. If you have time sheets to approve, PTO to approve, and the rest will be here. Here's your time, time off list and you can set up your time codes. You've got different kinds of reports that you can use, okay? But we're not going to go through those today. A lot of these reports are also mirrored in QuickBooks because of the sync, keep that in mind. Okay, so then I'm gonna click on company settings. You can have company info, admin, contact, custom options, account and billing, payroll and overtime, any rules. If you have California overtime, you've got that there. Time options time entry, time off. There's some cool things like, do you want them to use the mobile app? Can they edit their past notes? Can they change the time they clocked out? Do you need signatures? Uh, there's location features are really cool. So if you need them to check in close to a location, you can use geofencing or, or, ge or location tracking. Okay. And that's there. And then you've got notifications and you can set the geofence radius of individual clients. Here's your nearby clients. Okay, my team. All right, access restrictions. Are you gonna authorize computers by cookie or IP address and so forth, notifications. And your system log, okay. Uh, if you have sync issues, that's usually addressed up here. I'm not clicking on buttons because I always break it. Uh, but, um, but that would be addressed up in the top right. It usually lists what the sync looks like and things like that. Um, but that's, yeah, that's pretty much QuickBooks time. So let's go ahead and click out of that. I'm, you could tell I'm starting to try to keep it. We're trying to get through everything walking with purpose wise. Okay, so now we're gonna touch on budgets, which is one of my favorite topics. Um, so you can create a budget using Spreadsheet Sync and we are gonna demonstrate that. But before we do that, I wanna show you how you do it without Spreadsheet Sync. And yes, that will also function as your Spreadsheet Sync demo. So uh, if you have additional questions about how, how Spreadsheet Sync works, I think there is an older demo of Spreadsheet Sync or just let us know and we'll, we'll try to get something together. You wanna set up your budget. Do you want a profit and loss? Budget, do you want what period? I'm just gonna say it's for period 2024 because it's that kind of year, time of year. If you have a subdivided budget, so I do one maybe on locations or classes or teams. If you do location, you know, what which location do you want to do the budget for? Maybe you want to do it on customers. Okay. That's a cool way if you don't have project tracking turned on, I bet it would give you some cool budgeting abilities. Available setup options, you can do custom budgets. I'm gonna leave mine as a consolidated budget or like a general budget. 
Okay, so here you go. You can turn on reference data where it shows your uh, reference data. I'm gonna pick like 2021. There you go, so you've got some information. Maybe I say that I wanna make this $12,000 and I wanna carry it across. There you go, okay. You can say show reference, hide reference. You can also set this quarterly and a yearly, okay. I do mine monthly, but I kind of also, I probably could do it quarterly. Uh, and then if you wanted to do spreadsheet sync, you could do it here, okay? But we are actually going to do it there. So let me go ahead and hit save and close. And I'm going to show you what the budget versus actual report looks like. Yeah, close. Okay, let's go down to budget overview, budget versus actuals. Let's do that. There you go. So then this is our 2024 budget versus actuals report. It would give you similar results with a budget overview report, especially since we don't have data in there for 2024 yet. But just as this is what's budgeted, this is what was on, over under budget, here's a percent of budget. Okay, and yes, you can customize this report. Okay, compare another period, any dollars remaining. Okay, and then I could also customize and save a customization. Funny enough, that's budgets, but we are gonna jump over in a spreadsheet sync and do a budget. So let's go here. Back to budgets, create and spreadsheet sync. Let's go. Okay, here we go. Uh, yeah, see, I tried to pre-prep it. So I did log in uh, while we were on break and I have this up for Cubo Advanced Demo. I'm gonna hit next. All right, see, you can manage your budgets. You can run a report, you can add and edit data, run multi-company reports, which is in beta. So if you need to do consolidated reporting, you can do that or manage budgets. Let's create a new budget. Okay, so here we are in the budget. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead. All right, so there you go, total budget. If you got to miss the part where I was trying to figure out why I couldn't update my total budget number, but it is protected cell, so genius me, right? So this way, if I wanted to kind of like copy that and bring it over, I could do that. You see that? Now I can sync it to QuickBooks. And that is spreadsheet sync in a nutshell. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and do the multi-company report feature. So we're gonna hit run multi-company reports. And this is in beta, so if it acts funny, uh, I apologize in advance. I'm gonna go ahead and hit test group. Select report to run, p &L. Okay. And then we just go through the filtering and hit run report. This is how you do consolidated reports for QuickBooks Online without a third party add-in. Uh, one, some considerations when you're working with consolidated reports, you obviously want to make sure that your chart of accounts is the same or is as similar as possible in both files so that it kind of brings everything in together. This one, it they're, they are not similar files. So you're gonna see just that basically it gets added here and they're in different columns, you know? But you want the names to mimic so that you can do the consolidated reporting that way. And then you have your total here, okay? That's consolidated reporting using spreadsheet sync and budgets with spreadsheet sync. And you could do lists as well and a bunch of other stuff. It's super, super, super helpful. Okay, so I'm gonna hit done. That was spreadsheet sync. All right, let's move back to QuickBooks. I'm getting a little stuffy all of a sudden. All right, so let's go to projects. As you saw with our budgets feature and with some of our reports feature, if you don't turn on projects, there's also other ways to look at your profitability for different customers and projects. Okay. Um, you can uh, apply t employee time here. I think I covered that in my other Cubo demo. So, in fact, here you go, job cost test today. I think this is where I put it in, actually. You can hit job costing, and it lists, it was on August 15th of 2022. Here's a customer it went to, labor, they had a cost rate entered, okay? And then it comes up on their job cost thing, on their job cost report. Okay, or on their project report rather. It says how many open invoices you have, how many overdue invoices you have. Then you can go to transactions, what estimates, invoices, expenses, and bills are there. You have time activity, different project reports, project profitability, time cost by employer or vendor, unbilled time and expenses, estimates versus actuals. And you can attach things, okay? 
So there you go, that's projects. All right, and then you can also do invoices, receive payment, expense, project estimate, time, bill, purchase order there too. So we've covered budgets, we've covered spreadsheet sync, we've covered projects. Now let's cover workflows next. I'm gonna go ahead and pause the video for a moment. Okay, so we're ready to talk about workflows. As you can see, there are several workflow templates. That I do believe this is a feature only available in QuickBooks Online Advanced. So if you have questions about that, let me know. Uh, we've got bank deposit reminders, uh, estimates reminders, reminding, so on and so forth. Uh, and that's where you get the piece about um, invoice reminders, follow-up invoice, estimate, follow oh, estimates. And when I first started using this, if you look at my last demo, I think there's like six or nine of these. And now there's like just gobs, gobs and gobs and gobs. Okay. Automatically send unsent invoices. That could be dangerous though. Okay. Moving on, moving on. There you go. Rem employee work anniversary. Oh, that's nice. Employee work anniversary reminder. Okay. So that's where your workflows are. Then you pick my workflows here. Okay. All right, so we've got a schedule report test and we've got, um, there we go, and something else there. So let's see, invoice send, how about reminder? Try invoices created, send a customer email invoice number needs your attention. So that's how you do invoice reminders in QuickBooks Online Advanced. And plus you would do it under the settings. Perfect. So that's workflows. I'm sure there's more that we can go through there, but uh, if you have questions, let me know. And that brings us down to taxes. So let's go into sales tax. About a year or two ago, QuickBooks made an automated sales tax in product feature. So you can actually uh, figure out where your nexus is. You can uh, set up a whole bunch of information here and it can uh, walk you through your sales tax. It's not quite as difficult to track manually like some of us have had to do. Uh, me, I have had to do it. In fact, it's hard for me, honestly, sometimes to let go and let things be automated. What I've learned is uh, just because it is automated doesn't mean you don't need to double check it. Um, so then this will say, you know, it's due to North Carolina Department of Revenue. You can review the tax return that it prepped for you, okay? There you go. And I'll tell you to file it. Okay. Economic nexus. So for those who may not have heard the term nexus, that basically means where you have enough of a presence in a certain location to need to pay sales tax. And different states, different nexus rules. Okay. It's not like there's one definition for all states because that would be way too easy. Uh, every state sets their own nexus rules. So you need to know what the nexus rules are in your state. Okay, see, there you go. Sometimes you don't have to have a physical location there. See that? And I'll say, we think you have nexus in these states. So that's really cool. Okay, that's sales taxes. And there's additional sales tax reports underneath um, the report section, actually, that we've already covered. So then we get to 1099 filings. Okay, you can do 1099 filings in QuickBooks. I'm not gonna do it here, but you can do 1099 filings in QuickBooks at year end. We're gonna move on, my accountant. If you were a customer, uh, this would list who your accountant was, and you could do what requests your accountant sent to you, and any documents you had shared between you, okay? Banking services, if you want QuickBooks checking, you know, you've got commerce, here I'll do the overview. Uh, if you are in e-commerce and you have a lot of volume, obviously this would be a lot more built out. I've got it synced to my Shopify demo, okay? And then we've got the orders tab, because there's no orders, that's why he's saying that, and then the payouts, okay? If you wanna look for apps for your business, you would do that here in the apps section, okay? Those are some old apps that I need to clean out. And then I believe that's it for our left-hand navigation. You can hit menu settings. You can go to the old menu. Uh, like I said, they do update it frequently. They usually give you an amount of time where you can kind of take a look at the old menu. We've covered everything under the left-hand navigation possible. Books review is more for accountants uh, on the accountant firm side that would use that, I believe. I don't know if it's available in the client version or not. So it's an overview piece, okay? The next thing we'll cover are the quick create. 
is the quick create. But let me go ahead and pause this video and I'll be right back. All right, we are back. Thank you for my for my uh, breaks, actually. I make sure it's been recording. I've had a, a number of occasions where it actually didn't record. So we just chalk that up to practice, shall we? Okay, so let's move on. We've got our quick create button up in the top left and you've got invoices, which we've covered and receive payments, estimates, credit memo, sales receipts, refund receipts, delayed credit, delayed charges and add customer. We've already gone through how to add the customer center and that's where you would add a customer. So I'm gonna hit receive payment, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and hit test customer because I always use test customer. Um, and you can actually uh, click and it will automatically generate how much you have received. However, what if I got an invoice payment and say, I'm sure some of us have had this happen, where the check name is different than the customer names in your system. Maybe it's like a legal name or something. And you're like, I don't know who this is. Okay, you could actually, um, let's say, let's pick 236. We can go ahead, we don't even need a customer name. Hit find my invoice number, 236. We believe you might mean this one, okay? So you can actually look it up by invoice number, which is awesome. You can deposit to your undeposited uh, funds, which is, this is actually a canned account that comes with your QuickBooks Online. If you need to batch your deposits, nowadays I use my mobile deposit and I kind of do them one by one. So I usually just deposit mine straight to the bank, okay? but you don't have to do that. If, like I said, if you're gonna be doing like five checks at one time, definitely use that undeposited funds. That way it batches it in a one amount once it hits your checking account and makes your reconciliation way easier, okay? So we're gonna check everything there. Everything looks good. Save and close. All right, next, and you know what? I'm gonna change our background there because all the red little buttons are driving me a little bonkers. Estimates. Okay, we can pick our test customer again. And what you see there, we have customer and then the sub customer, that's where it was talking about, do you wanna turn those to projects? Cause sub customers can frequently be a project. You can have pending estimates, okay? You can have accepted, closed and rejected and that does pull into your project functions. So just make sure those statuses are up to date, okay? And then you've got your regular columns, right? Okay, perfect. Okay, everything good? Uh, this one has obviously been a little tampered with. Let's see if we can refresh it. That's more like what I was looking for. Let's see if it'll just stay the same. There we go. Okay, something went a little funky there for a minute. So then you've got your estimate date, you've got your shipping information and the rest of it, and then you can add what you need for the estimate. Estimates are non-posting transactions. They're not gonna make any effect to your books. In most cases, they're not gonna affect your P&L and your balance sheet. They're just there uh, to provide your customer an estimate, okay? You can hit printer preview. If you need to make this estimate record recurring, you can. If you need to customize it, you can. But we're gonna get to the custom forms soon, okay? Receive payment estimate credit memo. Credit memo. Okay. Less biscuits. There we go. All right, credit memo is exactly what you think it is. It's a credit memo. So if you need to give them a credit against an invoice, I always recommend uh, doing this through a credit memo versus editing the actual invoice itself. Uh, for tracking purposes. So you would actually fill this out and then it would you could apply it to your invoice through the apply payment screen or receive payment screen that we just covered. Or if you have auto apply on there, it might actually just do it for you, okay? Sales receipt, so the difference between a sales receipt and an invoice, if you're like at a register and you're doing transactions, it's going straight in the bank account, there's no estimate, there's no waiting period, nothing. It goes straight to revenue. That's a sales receipt. If, however, you're issuing a document and then you're getting paid later, that's an invoice. That's where it's gonna to touch your AR account, your accounts receivable account, and then hit your bank. Sales receipt goes straight to revenue, okay? That's your difference. Um, you can choose to use invoices even if you're taking payment at the point of sale and just go back in and do a receive payment right after. It's up to you. But that's basically the difference between sales receipt and invoices. Refund receipts will apply the refund, 
okay they say it actually will if it's through payments into it payments it'll apply it through into it payments i have seen where this doesn't happen you have to go into your Intuit Payments Merchant Center and do it by hand, uh, but in theory, it's supposed to do it for you. Delayed credit is where that unbilled charges report we saw earlier. If I do a delayed credit or a delayed charge, that's where it would pop up, and then you can apply it to invoices once you get to that point. Those are both the exact same thing, just different, different flavors, right? Add customer we've talked about. Vendors, we've talked about, ex have we talked about expenses? Let's so talk about expenses. Expenses are basically like write check is in desktop. So uh, you just enter your payee and the rest of it. And funny enough, you have a write check function in QuickBooks Online too, but there's no real equivalent of expense in desktop, I don't believe. Then you have checks, okay. And then it says to print later. I need to remember to do that demo too. Uh, bills, pay bills, we did bills and pay bills. We'll go to purchase order, we did that already. Vendor credit, it's the same thing as the other one. Credit card credit, same thing if you get a refund on the credit card. Honestly, I usually wait for those to come in through the bank feeds, uh, but if you need to enter it manually, you can. Let's go to your print checks. I have a print checks video on how to set up your printer and do the whole shebang. If you need to see it, it's on our YouTube channel. But if you just need to go ahead and print your checks, it would come up here, you'd pick the account you're printing them from. Okay, okay, you see that? I say okay a lot, okay, okay, moving on. I need to draw. Okay, if you need to add check, you can go ahead and hit check and I'll go to the print screen and that's where you print your checks. If they're printing out funky, you need to go back through and set up your checks for printing, okay? Um, let's go back to print checks. Print setup, that's where you do this. If you need to order checks, you can. Quite honestly though, you can get check stock pretty easily. Just make sure it's either voucher or standard and try to make sure that it's compliant with QuickBooks or that you can return it. But the funny thing is with checks is a lot of the companies don't let you return it. So just be careful where you buy it. All you do to set up your checks to print is to follow the prompts. You load the paper in your printer. I find it helpful to have a light a lamp or something nearby so I can kind of look at the grids because of what it does is it has like a grid and it's going to show you the, the grid over top of your check and you just have to line it up and um, let's see, continue setup. Continue setup. And you use the grids to decide how far off you want your horizontal and vertical. Uh, line alignment to go. That's how you set up your checks. Okay. Ad vendor, we've covered that already. We've covered payroll. We're going to go to single time activity. So you don't have to use QuickBooks time to do time activity, but if you do have QuickBooks time integrated with QuickBooks online, you never want to use the regular time activity button because it's not going to go back to QuickBooks time. I don't believe, but I could be wrong on that. Um, it used to actually have an alert here that says, are you trying to enter time? Please do that in QuickBooks time. Okay, but if you don't have QuickBooks time enabled, you can do the manual time activity screen. All right, and then you've got your date, your name, your cost rate, your customer service, billable or not, how much is billable for, is it taxable services, what location and class, do I want to enter my start and end times or just put in my hours and minutes and what's the description you want to show, and this will show on customer invoices if you wanted to. Okay. Bless, okay, hit cancel. Time. You can also do a weekly timesheet. There you go. Okay. Okay. And then we can go to add employee, but we've we've already covered that piece. We've talked about contractors. We've talked about projects and project estimates. I'll click on that real quick. Okay. Project cost estimate, and this ties into your projects. It does your estimated profit margin, estimated cost, and estimated income. That's very similar to a regular estimate. Okay. All right, moving down, we've got tasks. We've covered tasks, bank deposits. We've not covered that. So what'll happen is where we entered these and it goes to like undeposited funds like we just talked about, you can pick which account you need to deposit it to. I'm gonna pick operations and then you can pick which invoices you're depositing and see what this does is instead of four lines on your bank reconciliation report, you're gonna have one and it's gonna match the batch amount that you deposited. Save and close. 
Okay. Transfers. Transfers are not affecting your bank account. These are transfers from in the books. So if I wanted to, you could use the transfer to pay a credit card, or if I'm transferring money from checking to savings, that's what you would use a transfer for. So I'm just gonna say operations to payroll checking, 10,000. Okay, okay. And that's how that works, it's super easy. Uh, when you hit pay credit card, that's actually a different flavor of the transfer screen. Journal entry, so if you need to do journal entries, which you know a lot of us have to do on occasion, uh, you've got a regular journal entry here, you've got journal entry number, is it adjusting or not? The important thing to notice about journal entries is to never use them to try to update your inventory accounts on your balance sheet. And that's a really common thing that you see where somebody's like, well, my inventory's off by you know, $10 or $20 or whatever. Um, so I'm just gonna move the money out of the inventory account with a journal entry. But what, what do you not see here? You don't see any items. So what you'll do is you'll offset your, your account, but you're not actually changing the items themselves. So what happens is you run your stock valuation report and it's not gonna match what's actually in your GL account, okay? And if that's Latin, uh, sign up for a Q&A and we'll walk you through it. But basically it's like, if I have one item for $10 and it should be 20, if I don't use an inventory adjustment to change the value of that item and I do a journal entry or think I'm doing a journal entry, there's no field here that says item, okay? So it's just gonna sit on the GL account or the general ledger account, my balance sheet account. It won't change the item itself. So when I run my inventory reports, my inventory valuations, they're not gonna match my, my balance sheet now because the amounts are not tying in to the items, if that makes any sense. I apologize if it doesn't. Um, but so it's just really important to know when you have inventory, just be really careful about how you're adjusting those quantities. Okay, and there's your inventory quantity adjustment right there. Another thing I see a lot of is where people adjust inventory quantity, but adjust it back to the inventory account and all it really does is washes it in and out and doesn't really fix the amounts you need it to fix. So watch for that too. It's a really common thing to do. Inventory is super tricky. Uh, it's so, um, yeah, it just is, it's super tricky. It used to intimidate me a lot. And I had to, I, it's one of those things you have to just learn it. You just have to learn it. So we've talked about journal entries. We've talked, let's do statements. So statements are a group of invoices and sending that report to your customer to say, uh, you've got an open balance with us or here's your activity. You don't have to do it for a balance. Maybe they say, hey, what did I pay in the last month? Oh, let me send you a statement, okay. And that's where you would do it. You can do a balance forward statement, like what do they owe, any open item where it's listed, the open items are listed, and a transaction statement, which is where they say, can you let me know what I paid? And we'll just kind of work through it, okay? Okay, that brings us to inventory quantity adjustment. Okay, we've got the adjustment date, what inventory, so this is how it should be. You need to have a shrinkage account or an adjustment account and you need to pick the product you need to adjust. Do not use journal entries, use this. So I'm just gonna pick apple trees. What's my new quantity? I actually have 20. And then pick a class, save and close, and I'll do the journal entry in the back end, okay? Move on to batch transactions. Batch transactions are awesome. It's kind of like having Excel in QuickBooks. You can also import. Okay, you can do invoices, bank deposits, sales receipts, bills, expenses, and checks. Okay. Pay down credit card, we talked about that. It's just like uh, transfers. Which credit card did you pay? And literally all it's doing is like a transfer transaction. And it's not affecting your bank. Um, and then these are apply for capital, it's kind of a sales thing, so I'll skip past that. Add products or service. We'll have inventory, non-inventory service and bundle, which we covered. That is your quick create button. So I'm gonna go ahead and pause again, and then I'm gonna jump over to our gear and finish that out, and then we've come full circle. Okay, guys, we're back in live. Okay, so let's go ahead and go up to our gear. We've already touched on account and settings, so we're next gonna check on manage users, okay? We get asked about this a lot. There is a comparison video if you kind of want to look at the rundown between setting up users in different versions. 
in QuickBooks Online Advanced and with the other ones, you met, you have uh, the users we talked about. So with this one, we have 25 users, but like with Plus, we would have five or whatever, what have you. And uh, you could set up a role-based permissions, okay? So that means you define the role and then you assign the user. Whereas sometimes you can set up users and then you have to pick everything one by one, okay? So you've got company admin, expense manager, expense submitter. This is a little bit, this is a lot more robust than what you'll see in Plus. So your experience with Plus Essentials, that will not be the same. Payroll manager, sales manager, and the rest. Okay, everybody see that? And then you can add a role if you have one that has uh, specific requirements for you. So you see, click there, okay. And then you can have, Expenses, which you want them to have for expenses. Inventory. Lists. Bookkeeping. Accounting. Budgets. Payroll. Reports. Time tracking. Apps. Account management. There you go. And so you can set up very custom roles. If you just wanted to assign an employee a very specific set of permissions, I might set somebody up like, hey, I want Susie to have a very unique set of permissions no one else is gonna have. I'm gonna say Susie's role. You can do whatever you want. This is your system, okay? So when you have sales, also notice you can pick at the, at the location level, okay? See if you can do it for expenses. You can't do it for expenses. But sales, if you have a sales rep, somebody somebody like that, they work out of a specific location, you don't want them to see the other locations, you can set that up. Okay, so we'll move back over here. So regular users, these are your in-office users. Uh, we talked about roles, and you can see that they've been set up with specific roles. You can also look at the user's activity. See here, so you can see that we've been moving around a lot today. Whoops. There you go, okay. And I've done it again. I have to go back in. Hold on. Manage users. Okay. There you go. So you can look at the user activity. You can edit them and so on. We already talked about roles. And then accountants. So if you have an accounting firm, they are not counted in your billable users. You can set them up and then they have cool tools like our accountant tools at the top and things like that that help them maintain your account. Okay. And you can add three firms with advanced, but I know you have fewer options with the other ones. Next, we're coming over to custom form styles, which I get asked about a lot. I'm not the one in our office who does these kinds of things, um, but I'll show you how to do it. And that style replicator, I'm gonna be crazy and jump on it, but we'll see if it works for us or not. Okay, so we've got invoice template, test, and so I picked invoice, but you can do this with estimates and um, the rest as well. Test. We go to design, do we want to use a template? Airy new, airy classic, I think we use modern. I like friendly a lot, but then I look at bold and I'm like, that is gonna eat a lot of printer ink if I have to print those. So just keep that in mind when you're picking your template. You can't really, you don't have your own custom template here if you use this option, but uh, it does give you the option to pick some really cool templates. Then you can change your logo and placement your colors, which I think actually pulls from the colors in your logo as recommendations to start with. I may have that wrong, but I'm pretty sure it does. Uh, you have a selection of fonts and you can print it out. What content? You can change your header, your table, and your footer. Okay, there you go, there you go, there you go. And let me go through that one more time a little bit slower. If you need location tracking, it talks about that. If you need to do locations there, you've got your business name, what do you wanna show up? Address, website, form names. Do you wanna call it an invoice or do you wanna call it give me money? Whatever you wanna call it, you can change it. Custom transaction numbers, we already did. In our settings, we have display, what our custom fields are, but we're gonna talk about that later, okay? And then when we send emails, how do we wanna set up, okay? And what do we want the reminder email to say? Hit done, okay. Style replicator, that's in beta. Ah, so that's what, so typically you have to use their templates, but it looks like here, if you have your own custom invoice, you can try the style replicator and that is very new. 
We're not going to do that today because I don't have one to demo, but that's there and it's in beta. So it could be awesome. It could also glitch. We'll see. Usually, well, obviously, by the time it hits live, live, like for everybody and it's standard, they've gotten the glitches out. That's why it has beta. So you have estimate, sales receipts, and invoices. That's what you can do it for. So next on our gear, we did that one. We did that one. Custom form styles. We're done with chart of accounts. Okay. So chart of accounts. Uh, I'm sure everybody's kind of familiar with what this is. These are the accounts you're applying your transactions to, and these make up the backbone of your financial statements. Okay. You can view registers for all of them. You can connect a bank to the checking accounts from here. You can hit edit. You can make it inactive. So if you have limitations to the number of accounts you have, you don't have those with advance, but you do with the others. You can make uh, ones that you're not using anymore inactive, so it reduces your usage. And you can run reports. Okay. You also have your batch actions. So if I wanted to make like multiple ones inactive, I could go ahead and do that. I hit make inactive. Okay. If I wanted to batch edit, I just click there. Super helpful if you're changing account numbers. Okay, and I think that's about all there is to see on the chart of accounts. If you had bank accounts set up and linked to it, the bank balance would show there. Okay, I'm going to click, and you can also import them. Yes, go back up to the gear. Okay, themes. I have not used themes yet. Uh, we'll turn that on for real quick. There, you see it in dark mode. Now we're going to see it in light mode. There you go. Get the desktop app. There is an app. I heartily recommend it if you have a big file uh, because if you're using the web browser version, it has a lot to do with your bandwidth as to what uh, how fast data is coming over and so on. So if you get the desktop app, some of that is, is uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Some of that isn't as bad. Additional info. Here's your shortcuts. Okay. I wish I just call that shortcuts. All right, lists. We have all lists. We've gone over your chart of accounts. We've kind of gone over recurring transactions. We've definitely gone over products and services. So let's go ahead and go into recurring transactions real quick. Okay. Have a reminder list. Okay. You've got these are your recurring. So when you're in the transaction at the bottom, it says make recurring. This is where that goes. So if you're like, I made it recurring, but I don't know where it went. It went under your gear, under recurring transactions. Okay. Let's go to attachments. If you've attached something to either a transaction or a list item or just in general, because you can just put it up on the general uh, library, attachment library, then it'll show here. If it's shared, it goes to my account. It, or you can also see it under my account. It. Custom fields, we promise we talk about this. Okay, so with custom fields, you can set up very robust fields. So these are some that they suggest. We're just going to test. What kind of data type do you have? Is it just a text and number field? Is it a number field, a date, or a drop down list? If you pick drop down, which is my favorite because it makes people choose from certain, you know, values, so you can report on it. I use drop down list item. What kind of category, what forms do you want this to apply to? Your customers, transactions, vendors, or projects? And then what forms do you want it to apply to? Sales, da 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 da. You can go all the way down here. Okay. And that's your custom field. Oops. Okay. Okay. Let's see if I. There you go. Yeah. Perfect. Let's see if we have test. Let me do it one more time. Test. Drop down. There you go. Cabal. See that? All right. So then we've gone over custom fields. Let's go over tags. And then this prompts our class versus tags conversation. Okay. If you're throwing like an entertain, like a party for your customer or something like that, where you're wanting a report on what you spent, 
tags are a great use because it's going to tag the transactions with what you want and then you can pull that report out informally from a management level and take a look at that spend. It doesn't uh, zero out, like it doesn't balance on your financials. So I can like, if I have 100 transactions and I apply it to 25, it doesn't care, okay? However, with classes, it's going to, if you don't assign a class to it, it goes under a column called unspecified transactions and you have to go in there and fix it. So if you have something where you're like, I need to track this this way, it's very important because it has certain you know, tax implications or very important implications, classes are the way to go. If you have something like, we're gonna throw a fundraiser and I'd like to track the transactions that went with it, use your tags, okay? That's my explanation of tags and classes. Okay, then you have the rules again, which we've covered already, okay? Well, we've already talked about managed workflows. We've talked, okay, so reclassify transactions. I'm 99% sure this is an accountant only tool. Um, so I won't touch on this, but if it's not, I apologize. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and move on from there. Okay, reclassify transactions. You can import data, import your desktop data, export data. Reconcile, we've touched on budgeting, we've done spreadsheet sync, we've done audit log, we've done backup company, we have not done, um, there you go. Okay. So you have online backup and restore. It used to be included. I think it's either you have to pay for it now or they've decided not to continue it. I'm not 100% sure, but they did just change that. And you have smart look. Okay. Oh, and that's for uh, customer support. Sorry. in your resolution center for any tickets and so on. With that all being said, um, here, I'll touch on this real quick. This is account at view we're in now. I spoke to you about business view and how the terminology is a little bit different. You'll notice my menu got a lot shorter, okay? Okay, you still have a lot of the same features. It's just a little bit more focused on the business owner or the business operator than it is on, say, you know, your in-house accountant or your accountant. Okay. Um, I think that's everything. If I've missed anything, let me know. I, yeah, I think we're good. Thank you so much for following along. I think right now we're around two and a half, three hours. So I know that our editor is going to love this and all the edits she's going to have to do. Sorry, Miss Rebecca. Thank you so much. If you liked this video, please make sure to like the video below. If you like the kind of content we have on Certum, please make sure to subscribe to our channel so you get alerted of new stuff. Thank you so much, and I hope you have a great, great day.